While WrestleMania V in Atlantic City had its own polarising element when it came to the men who main evented the show, nothing divided fans quite like Warrior vs Hogan at WrestleMania VI. The WWF decided to put its two top babyfaces against each other in a match billed as the ultimate challenge. Both the Intercontinental Championship and the WWF title would be up for grabs. It was truly a spectacle for the ages that tested the loyalty of die-hard WWF fans. Would supporters rally behind Hulk Hogan, the man who elevated the WWF to heights the company had never seen before? Or would they get behind the Ultimate Warrior, an embodiment of a new generation who done nothing but excite fans with his intensity and outlandish character? The WWF's alpha competitor Hulk Hogan would also be put to the test, had years and years of being the quintessential good guy finally made fans grow tired and bored? Was it time for Hulk Hogan to pass the torch and let someone else bask in the babyface limelight? Let's take a look as we continue our Hulk Hogan series. Our next stop is WrestleMania 6 in the Toronto Skydome. The Ultimate Challenge. WWF Champion Hulk Hogan vs Intercontinental Champion The Ultimate Warrior. Winner takes all. If I'm being totally honest here, Hogan and Warrior's paths didn't cross all that often in the run up to WrestleMania 6. This was a departure from previous WrestleManias, as Hogan's main body of work throughout a calendar year would all lead to the WrestleMania main event. WrestleMania 6 was different. It seemed like the WWF were willing to forego a deep story and instead, the company would bank on the insane popularity of both The Ultimate Warrior and Hulk Hogan. Looking back, it was neither the right nor the wrong move. Hogan vs Warrior at WrestleMania 6 is absolutely fine the way it is and it would be wrong to try and go back and rebook things, but at the same time, could you imagine if Warrior and Hogan were given a year long story that culminated at WrestleMania? It would have been great for sure. Hogan though was busy doing a little promotional work for his No Holds Barred movie and maybe the WWF wanted to get back to basics a little with WrestleMania 6. No deep angle needed. Let the men go out and let the fans tell the story. I wouldn't change a thing if I'm honest, but it's still interesting to think about how the WWF could have told a longer story here with the ultimate challenge. Still, what I'm getting at is that this video won't have the twists and turns that were found in the Mega Powers saga, so we'll need to take a look at both men's individual journeys towards the Toronto Skydome to gain a bigger picture. The Ultimate Warrior made his WWF debut in June of 1987, then known as the Dingo Warrior, and immediately the Warrior began destroying jobbers and lower mid-card talent. Real name Jim Helwig, the Ultimate Warrior was booked as an unstoppable force in wrestling. He was well known for his high energy entrances, his colourful ring gear and his face paint. His ability to absorb punishment from his opponents was something we had never seen before, turning matches around in his favour in practically no time at all. The man was a spectacle of the ring. There was a legit shift in atmosphere when Warriors music played in the arena as fans got on their feet to cheer for this over the top real life superhero. Warriors first big feud in the World Wrestling Federation was against Hercules Hernandez leading to a match between the two men at Wrestlemania 4. But when we talk about 1988, there was no bigger night for the Ultimate Warrior than SummerSlam. The Honky Tonk Man had set records with his 454 day intercontinental title reign, but when the Ultimate Warrior was revealed as Honky Tonk Man's surprise opponent at SummerSlam, a real moment in wrestling took place when the Warrior won the IC title. During a memorable feud with Ravishing Rick Rude, Warrior dropped and regained the intercontinental title while his crowd support continued to grow, and after the Warrior was booked to defeat Andre the Giant at numerous shows across the United States, States, Jim Helwig was established as a main event player. Following the Andre the Giant feud, Ultimate Warrior's next stop was the 1990 Royal Rumble, and it was here when the Warrior would stand face to face with Hulk Hogan on pay per view for the very first time. 
After Hulk Hogan had defeated Randy Savage at WrestleMania 5, it was business as usual for the real American. The Hogan vs Savage match was booked on live event after live event, the WWF capitalising here on their big drawing WrestleMania 5 main event by taking the match on the road. Before Mania 5, Hulk had filmed the WWF produced movie No Holds Barred, with Vince McMahon feeling that Hogan had the drawing ability to attract film goers of the late 80s. The movie reportedly broke even. No real profits were made here, but it wasn't through the WWF's lack of trying. In order to sell the movie as a pay per view spectacular, Tiny Lister, who played the villain Zeus in the No Holds Barred film, was brought into the WWF for a few matches and appearances. Today, we can look back and shake our heads at how silly this may have been, but you have to remember that in the 80s, Hulk Hogan was legitimately one of television's biggest stars, a real household name that fans really couldn't get enough of. The movie seemed like a win-win situation, make more money from the Hulk Hogan name while attempting to break into Hollywood, what really could go wrong? Well, the movie itself was the problem. No Holds Barred was panned by critics, and while some said that Hogan had an appealing on-screen quality about him, the movie itself was a different story altogether. Nonetheless, the WWF would bring the evil Zeus to wrestling audiences whether they liked it or not. Brutus Beefcake and Hulk Hogan defeated Zeus and Randy Savage at SummerSlam 89, and in December, Hogan and Beefcake again defeated Savage and Zeus at the No Holds Barred pay-per-view event. The pay-per-view featured the entire movie before a steel cage tag team match, and it's one of a few pay-per-views that still isn't available on the WWE Network. After Hogan got finished up with the No Holds Barred stuff, he too made his way to the 1990 Royal Rumble. Both Hogan and Warrior were in the Royal Rumble match itself. Warrior entered at number 21, Hogan entered at number 25. After eliminating some competitors from the match, both Hogan and Warrior were left in the ring alone. This was the moment where many fans began wanting something that they didn't know they wanted before. The penny dropped here. It was like, oh, Hogan and Warrior are alone in the ring. We weren't expecting this, but we also can't wait to see what happens next. Warrior and Hogan played it up perfectly too. The two men looked at each other before circling around the ring. The fans roared with anticipation as two of their heroes were about to collide in the squared circle. There would be no clear winner here. Warrior and Hogan took each other out with a double clothesline before the next competitor got in the ring. In the end, Hogan eliminated Warrior by accident and the Hulkster went on to win the whole thing. What we got here was a taste of things to come, an appetizer for WrestleMania 6. Fans wanted to see what would happen if Hulk Hogan faced the Ultimate Warrior in a one on one matchup. The following week on Saturday night's main event, Hulk Hogan and the Ultimate Warrior teamed up to take on the genius and Mr. Perfect. Hogan and Warrior showed signs of unity in the pre-match interview with Gene Okerlund and later in the ring, it seemed like both men were on the same page. Warrior and Hogan won the match, but afterwards, when the genius and Perfect launched a post-match attack, the Warrior accidentally hit Hulk Hogan. After some pushing and shoving, the two men left the ring and the fans were left wondering if it was really going to happen, would Hulk Hogan and the Ultimate Warrior meet in the middle of the ring? Well, fans wouldn't have to wait for long. Hulk Hogan was the man who put forward the ultimate challenge. He wanted to know which force was strongest in the World Wrestling Federation, Hulkamania or the power of the warrior. Both belts would be put on the line and the match was made official on February 10th, 1990. Hogan vs Warrior at WrestleMania 6. At the third main event show on February 23rd, 1990, Hulk Hogan was scheduled to defend his WWF title against the Macho King Randy Savage. James Buster Douglas would serve as the special guest ring enforcer here and this is interesting because Mike Tyson was actually supposed to referee this match. Buster defied the odds and got a knockout win over Tyson just two weeks before the main event show here, so Buster was brought in and Tyson was left out. Tyson would eventually make his way to the World Wrestling Federation at WrestleMania 14, but anyway, it's very interesting here when you consider that Vince McMahon and Jesse Ventura had been hyping Tyson's appearance for a month or so and then, just like that, Buster Douglas is in and Tyson is out. Anyway, Hogan wins the match when Buster makes the three count. A little later on, 
Braun, the Ultimate Warrior defended his IC title against Dino Bravo, and when Warrior got the pinfall win, Earthquake jumped into the ring to help Bravo with a post-match attack. Hulk Hogan ran to the ring to help the Warrior, but Warrior didn't seem too pleased with Hulk trying to help him out. The two men squared off once again, there was no punches thrown however, and before the main event show ended, both men cut backstage promos. Hogan said he helped the Warrior because he wants his WrestleMania opponent to be at 100% when it was time for WrestleMania 6, and the Ultimate Warrior talked about how the Hulkamaniacs around the world are maybe doubting that their hero can leave WrestleMania with both the WWF Championship and the IC title. Two weeks later on WWF Superstars, Warrior returned the favour when he saved Hulk Hogan from Earthquake. Warrior had a chance to clothesline Hogan, but he didn't do it. The two looked at each other before Warrior ran back to the gorilla position. And really, that was your build up for WrestleMania 6. There was also a backstage contract signing that took place in a few pre-recorded promos that aired on television shows, but this was pretty much it. As mentioned earlier though, Warrior vs Hogan didn't need anything more. What you have to keep in mind is that Hogan had just had a series of landmark WrestleMania main events that helped solidify him as WrestleMania's star attraction. For another babyface to come in and challenge the status of Hogan at WrestleMania, it was quite unheard of, but this was all that was needed to tell the story. What brought the Ultimate Warrior to the dance, in my opinion, was his appeal to the young teenage audience of the World Wrestling Federation. The comic book character that had came to life, that kind of thing really captured the imagination of fans who maybe began their WWF fandom as little Hulkamaniacs, but these same fans had grown over the course of 5 years or so. The Ultimate Warrior came across as a bit more edgy and a bit more cool. Of course, Hulk Hogan still had his legions of supporters. Hogan was still the premier all-American good guy and hero, but the character of the Ultimate Warrior seemed to tap into the imagination of young fans in a much more visceral way. The Warrior was maybe seen as more modern and with the times than Hulk Hogan. In the back of many people's minds, this was going to be another Hulk Hogan victory. It's no wonder either, one look at Hogan's WrestleMania history lets us know that the odds were stacked against the Warrior here. The Ultimate Warrior was the underdog at WrestleMania 6 in a way. Not only that, but Hulk Hogan and WrestleMania were just in sync with each other back then, both existed and flourished because of each other, so you always thought that, with the exception of WrestleMania 4, Hulk Hogan just couldn't be beat on the grand stage. Well, fast forward to April 1st, 1990, the Toronto Skydome, and the Warrior defeated Hogan to become the WWF Champion while still retaining the Intercontinental Championship. It was surprising to say the least, but let's look at the match itself before continuing on. First off, the Toronto Skydome, now known as the Rogers Centre, looked absolutely amazing for WrestleMania 6. A good arena helps WrestleMania stand out for sure, you kind of associate the arena with the event in many ways, and WrestleMania 6 is no exception. I always think of the giant wide video board when I think of this WrestleMania. Also, the WWF's production values had gone through some insane improvements since WrestleMania 5. Compare these two shows yourself, the camera work, the overall broadcast quality, the audio for the theme music, everything is much more updated with WrestleMania 6 and it does make the show a little more pleasant to watch. Hogan and Warrior each had pre-match promos and both were memorable, but Warrior's was on a different level. You need to watch this a few times, Warrior did deliver his promos in a peculiar way to say the least, but Warrior questioned Hogan's beliefs while saying he will bring the Hulkamaniacs and the Warriors together by winning the WWF Championship. It's an insane promo, I can't do it justice by talking about it and neither can anyone else. Go watch it and feel the power of the Ultimate Warrior. Right, let's look at the match. Now, I don't care what anyone says here, watch it back for yourself. It's undeniable that Hogan gets a much stronger crowd reaction during the entrances and in the opening moments of the bout. We've already talked about how both men had their fair share of supporters, and I'm not saying that there weren't tens of thousands of fans who wanted the Warrior to win, but watch the entrances and you'll see it for yourself. Hogan gets the better crowd response initially. The pre-match stare-down was phenomenal. Warrior looked so intense when he stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with Hogan, creating a WrestleMania moment by just having both men look at each other. The beginning of the match then played into both men being fan favourites and both men not giving an inch. If Warrior pushed Hogan, 
Hogan pushed Warrior right back. If Hogan overpowered the Warrior, Warrior would proceed to overpower the Hulkster. The two men even went through this routine with a test of strength in the opening minutes of the match, and while this kind of thing would get mocked in today's wrestling, the fans totally ate it up here at WrestleMania 6. It was the absolute right booking decision here, have both men look like equals. Hogan fell to the outside and it looked like he had blown his knee out, giving the warrior a little time to zone in on the injury, but within seconds, Hogan's knee had magically healed and the match played out as if nothing had happened. This was odd for sure, I think Hogan was trying to play possum, he did give warrior a thumb to the eye afterwards, but it just didn't translate well on TV. Things started getting even more strange when Hulk Hogan began getting the upper hand in the match, something that normally never happened. Hogan's matches were all about the heroic comeback, so it's strange to see a Hulk Hogan match during this time period that had Hogan in the driver's seat for so long. You have to remember that the Warrior was not used to long main event matches though. Warrior was all about the entrance and the character, he would smash his opponents in no time at all, win the match and leave the ring. He was limited in the squared circle, and so was Hogan to be fair, but the Hulkster had the experience here, it made sense for Hogan to set the pace and be the aggressor. If you need proof, when Warrior got back on his feet to mount some offence, he performed clothesline after clothesline, running from one side of the ring to the other, without much wrestling going on to be honest. Now, I'm not trying to pick apart the Ultimate Warrior here, this was his ring style and it worked for him. It got fans on their feet and it made the people scream and shout and that's really all you can ask for. However, I think Vince McMahon knew that a typical Ultimate Warrior match wouldn't quite cut it in the main event of WrestleMania, and so Hogan was able to take control of the match much more than his opponent. Warrior was able to get a bear hug on Hogan that lasted a very long time. The referee got wiped out after Hogan broke the bear hug, and Hogan pinned Warrior for the 1-2-3 while the ref was out cold. This was your Hogan insurance policy right here, folks. Hogan would have won the bout had the referee been there to make the count. The same thing happened moments later when Warrior pinned Hogan, but Hogan had Warrior beat first, of course. The audience went into overdrive when Hogan kicked out of the Gorilla Press Slam in the splash delivered by the Warrior. Hogan hulked up and went for the leg drop. Warrior moved out of the way, hitting another splash and scoring the pinfall win. But look at the pinfall here, and look at how Hogan still kicked out on three. Again, another Hulk Hogan insurance policy. He beat me, but he didn't really beat me. I mentioned that Hogan got a better crowd reaction at the start of the match, but when Warrior got the 1-2-3, the audience was absolutely deafening. I feel like I've been a little harsh here and I really don't mean to be. Previously I spoke about how Andre vs Hogan at Mania 3 gets a lot of flack for the in-ring wrestling, but I still feel that that match is really important and special, and that is how I also feel about Hogan vs Warrior. At WrestleMania 6, the main event competitors I felt did a great job of covering up both of their shortcomings and they gave the absolute best match they could, given the circumstances. At the time, it worked. The ultimate challenge was everything fans could have hoped for, and even bigger than all of this, was that we now had a new superstar at the very top of the mountain. Hulk Hogan had lost the WWF Championship to another babyface. At the time, it was booked as a passing of the torch, and while we now have the luxury of 2020 hindsight and we all know that it wasn't really a passing of the torch, it was still a special moment in WWF history, and that is something I can really respect. Wrestling isn't always about the moves in the ring or the politics at play, it's also the emotions fans go through from bell to bell, and how you feel when the match comes to an end. Hogan vs Warrior delivered on that front, it was a monumental moment in WWF lore and for that reason, even though the action inside the ropes wasn't a technical showcase, Hogan vs Warrior is still a special, must see match. Wrestling audiences, in particular WWF audiences, were always used to having one guy they loved versus one guy they hated in the ring. It was cut and dry, cheer for the hero, 
boo the villain. This time though, fans had to choose. This I feel is another layer that helped make the WrestleMania 6 main event so special. It wouldn't be the last time a huge babyface squared off with another huge babyface, but WrestleMania 6 was the first time it was done on a giant pay per view stage, and it's this key element that makes Hogan vs Warrior still stand out to this very day. Anyway, Hogan celebrated with the Warrior afterwards, something that fans see as an example of Hogan holding on to the spotlight, but it's also really hard to imagine the end of WrestleMania 6 without Hogan celebrating with Warrior, giving young fans of the WWF a feel good moment here to end the biggest show of the year. The Warrior would continue on as the WWF Champion, although he did have to forfeit the IC title, as apparently any single superstar isn't allowed to hold two belts at the same time, so why was the match booked in the first place? But anyway, Hulk Hogan moved into a feud with the 468 pound Earthquake. After this, the Hulkster stood up for his country when he faced Sergeant Slaughter at WrestleMania 7, and boy there's a big story to tell there, but this will all get covered in the next Hogan video uploaded to the channel. In the end, dropping the title to the Ultimate Warrior at WrestleMania 6 I felt was the right thing to do. Hogan did not lose any of his popularity throughout the remainder of 1990 and just a year later he was back in the WrestleMania main event. Normal service would very much resume. You'd hope after WrestleMania 6 that Hogan would see the upside in losing, how he could tell stories through defeat and play on the emotions of his very own fans, but that didn't really happen. Again, we can talk about this a little more in the very next upload. While The Ultimate Warrior would go on to defend the WWF Championship against a series of different opponents, Hogan would find himself feuding with Earthquake soon after WrestleMania 6. John Tenta had debuted in the WWF towards the end of 1989 and by WrestleMania 6 he had been booked as an unstoppable monster heel who would dominate his opponents with his sit down splash. In May of 1990 Earthquake would target Hulk Hogan and the Hogan vs Earthquake feud kicked off on a brother love segment that aired on the WWF Superstars of Wrestling show. It's became a classic segment, one of those moments that young Hulkamaniacs at the time will remember well to this day. While distracted by Jimmy Hart, Earthquake hit Hogan with a steel chair from behind, and then Earthquake repeatedly hit Hogan with his sit down splash, resulting in the Hulkster's ribs getting crushed before our very eyes. Hogan got destroyed by Earthquake, and due to his injuries and the loss of the WWF Championship in storyline, Hulk Hogan considered retirement, trying to pull at the heartstrings of the little Hulksters across the world. The WWF aired Hulk Hogan tribute videos to try to further cement that this was all real, we may never see Hulk Hogan again on TV, and if you want an idea of how effective this all was, have a look at the tribute video on YouTube and look at the comments from the little Hulkamaniacs who are now all grown up. Fans were even urged to send letters to Hulk Hogan, asking the real American to come back. Hogan stayed away from the ring and away from TV for around 4 months, taking a break from wrestling to further his acting career, something that Vince McMahon felt Hogan wanted to do on the side while remaining a loyal WWF superstar. After the Earthquake attack in May, the plan going forward would consist of a string of Hogan vs Earthquake matches where fans across America could see Hogan get his revenge, and in many ways this feud overshadowed what was going on with the Ultimate Warrior and the WWF Champion. Many people will say that Warrior didn't cut it as WWF Champion and he wasn't on the same level as Hulk when it came to generating interest in title matches, but the fact of the matter is, is that the WWF were still aggressively booking Hogan in storylines that resonated more with young fans. It wasn't really the Warrior's fault, had the WWF took the same time to build Warrior's programs and feuds, there wouldn't have been a problem. The WWF banked on Hulk Hogan a terrible lot during this era, something that would cost the promotion dearly as the years progressed. 
On the July 28th, 1990 episode of Saturday Night's Main Event, Hulk Hogan came back and the Hulkster announced he was coming after Earthquake, laying out a challenge for SummerSlam 1990. When Earthquake and Dino Bravo came to the ring, Tugboat ran into even the odds. Tugboat was scheduled to be in Hogan's corner during the SummerSlam match, but Earthquake and Bravo were able to take Tugboat out before the pay-per-view. The big boss man would stand in for Tugboat, and yeah, we have the return of Hulk Hogan at SummerSlam. Those letters that fans wrote obviously worked, and the outpouring of support had made Hogan see the light and it was time for a little revenge. Hogan vs Earthquake would take place before the Ultimate Warriors title defense against ravishing Rick Rude. The Hogan match predictably ended in a victory for the Hulkster after Hogan body slammed Earthquake on a table. Earthquake then got counted out. In the SummerSlam main event, the Ultimate Warrior successfully defended the WWF title in a steel cage. Sergeant Slaughter's character in wrestling was that of a former US Marine who served in Vietnam. Through the 70s and 80s, Slaughter had worked for the WWF, the NWA and the AWA, becoming an instantly recognisable superstar in his own right. After WrestleMania 6 in Toronto, Slaughter displayed an interest in returning to the WWF, however Vince McMahon wanted Slaughter to work as a heel. In order to do this, Slaughter would initially feud with Nikolai Volkov, saying that America had gone weak not only because Volkov had been accepted by American wrestling fans, but because America as a country was also going soft. At SummerSlam, Sergeant Slaughter was a guest on the Brother Love Show and Slaughter declared war on Nikolai Volkov, saying that America is too chicken to declare war while Sergeant Slaughter had courage. Slaughter has since admitted that he felt incredibly uncomfortable delivering promos of this nature, but this was nothing in comparison to what was coming up. While the WWF were in their own little world of wrestling in August of 1990, the invasion of Kuwait by Iraq, led by Saddam Hussein, was dominating global news. The invasion led to the Gulf War as American and coalition forces tried and succeeded in liberating Kuwait. This is a really, really quick outline of events here, but it's necessary to bring this up because the WWF and Vince McMahon felt that this international conflict would make for a great wrestling story and a great wrestling heel. It's incredible to think about nowadays, but Sergeant Slaughter would be turned into an Iraqi sympathizer. Claiming now that America had too much freedom, Slaughter would align himself with General Adnan on WWF shows. He would cut promos wearing a headdress while praising Saddam Hussein. Saddam even sent Slaughter a new pair of wrestling boots because Hussein was a big fan of Slaughter's work. And Slaughter would say that the future steps of his wrestling career could hopefully align with Saddam's high standards. Slaughter even announced he would conquer the WWF the same way Hussein conquered Kuwait. A line was being crossed here for the sake of viewership, and while the defeat of Sergeant Slaughter was inevitable and good would triumph over evil like always, a lot of people still didn't like what they were seeing on TV as a form of entertainment. Sergeant Slaughter talked about the public's reaction to this new character in the years that followed, and Slaughter revealed that threats were made to WWF offices that forced him to relocate his family for a period of time for the sake of their own personal safety. That's how serious this got. Whether you think everything is fair game in the world of entertainment is completely up to you, but at the end of the day, a man's family was seriously threatened for the sake of a wrestling storyline and a wrestling character. At the 1990 Survivor Series, Hulk Hogan continued his feud with Earthquake when the Hulkamaniacs, consisting of Hogan, Tugboat, Jim Duggan and the Big Boss Man, took on the Natural Disasters team of Earthquake, Dino Bravo, Haku and the Barbarian. Hulk Hogan was the sole survivor, winning the match for his team. This victory meant that Hogan would wrestle in the final Survivor Series match of the evening, and the show ended with Hogan and Warrior standing victorious with a win for the Babyfaces. Sergeant Slaughter, meanwhile, was dominant in his Survivor Series match, eliminating both Bushwhackers and Nikolai Volkov only to get disqualified when it looked like he was winning the whole match for his team. This of course was done to keep Slaughter away from the final Survivor Series match. The WWF were going to keep the Hogan and Slaughter confrontation for future events. 
It's been reported that the Ultimate Warrior lost the WWF Championship due to his lack of drawing power during 1990, and Vince McMahon went back to Hulk Hogan in order to try and regain the viewership numbers that the WWF got during the mid to late 80s. When you look at the pay-per-view buy rates though, this argument becomes a little more difficult to justify. SummerSlam 1990 and Survivor Series 1990 had grabbed more buys than the previous year's events, so I don't think Warrior losing the title was all down to viewership numbers. I also don't think the plan was always to give Hogan the title back at WrestleMania 7, but I do think that the Sergeant Slaughter stuff was making enough noise that it made a tremendous amount of sense to make Slaughter vs Hogan the main event at WrestleMania for the WWF Championship. Maybe Warrior wasn't easy to work with backstage, maybe Hogan made a political play to get the championship back, maybe Vince just didn't like Warrior's matches in the main event spots, who knows, but I don't think viewership was the issue at all here. Bruce Pritchard stated on his podcast too that originally the plan was for Tugboat to wrestle Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania 7. Hard to believe, but let's take his word for it for a moment. If that was the case, and the plan was also for Hogan to win the championship at WrestleMania, then Tugboat would have to defeat the Ultimate Warrior for the WWF Championship before WrestleMania in order to set up the big main event. That to me is just difficult to imagine, and so my theory, and it's just a theory, is that the Sergeant Slaughter storyline caught so much media attention and so much external buzz that Vince McMahon felt that the obvious thing to do was to make it a WWF title match at WrestleMania. He wanted to, originally, attract a record number of fans to the WWF's biggest show of the year, and in order to do that, it made sense to present the downfall of Sergeant Slaughter as the main event of the evening, with the WWF title up for grabs. The choice McMahon had to make here was all about who would close out WrestleMania in the last spot of the night. Who would headline the show, and Vince decided that Hulk Hogan winning the belt would be more attractive than the Ultimate Warrior successfully defending it. As previously mentioned though, don't ever count out the possibility of Hogan making a political play to get the strap either. At the 1991 Royal Rumble, the road to WrestleMania kicked off with Sergeant Slaughter defeating the Ultimate Warrior for the WWF Championship with a tremendous amount of help from Macho Man Randy Savage. Warrior had refused to give Savage a title shot before the Royal Rumble and so the Macho Man was getting a little revenge here. Due to the interference, Savage and Warrior would meet at WrestleMania 7 and it can be easily argued that they had the best match of the night, made even more special due to the retirement stipulation that was added to the showdown and Randy Savage reuniting with Miss Elizabeth after the final bell. To me, this would have been an excellent way to end WrestleMania 7 along with the WWF Championship being on the line, but it is what it is. Slaughter won the gold at the Royal Rumble and the Royal Rumble match itself came down to Earthquake and Hulk Hogan in the final moments. The Hulkster, of course, won the Royal Rumble. Hogan was interviewed backstage by Mean Gene Okerlund and during the interview, Mean Gene got word that Sergeant Slaughter was celebrating his title win by defacing the American flag. Hogan took exception to this, saying he would remove the WWF Championship from Slaughter as soon as possible. Shortly afterwards, Hogan was named the number one contender for the WWF title and Hogan vs Slaughter was penciled in for the main event of WrestleMania 7. WrestleMania 7 was originally going to be held in the Los Angeles Coliseum, a venue that could seat more people than the Pontiac Silverdome. The Super Bowl in 1991 took place at the Tampa Stadium in Florida, and security was a major concern during the event. Consider the whole Sergeant Slaughter character and what had gone down on WWF shows, and security also became a big concern for WrestleMania, apparently. The WWF would have to pay a huge bill if it were to effectively ensure the safety of talent and wrestlers, and it would have carried an extremely high price tag. Along with these concerns, ticket sales had been incredibly slow for Mania 7. That dream of selling out a stadium seemed more like a joke, and ultimately the decision was made to move WrestleMania into an indoor venue, the LA Memorial Sports Arena. 
As for the build-up towards WrestleMania and the creative direction of the main event, it was all about Hulk Hogan standing up for America while Slaughter continued to show support for Iraq. Though the overall tone was brought down a great deal, the aggressive nature of Slaughter's tirades were definitely getting tamer as the weeks went on. You had your standard Hulk Hogan beatdowns in the weeks leading up to Mania, this was all stuff we had seen before. A more controversial moment occurred backstage when Vince McMahon asked Slaughter to burn the American flag on TV, according to Slaughter himself. Slaughter refused to do it, so instead a Hulk Hogan shirt was set alight. The real kicker came though when Hulk Hogan said that Iraq would surrender in the war after he defeated Slaughter at WrestleMania. But ironically enough, on the 28th of February 1991, a whole month before WrestleMania, President Bush declared a ceasefire while announcing that Kuwait had been liberated. The war was over. Iraq announced it would accept all UN resolutions. And so the WWF storyline for the WrestleMania 7 main event wouldn't have nearly the same impact as originally intended. The LA Memorial Sports Arena was decked out in stars and stripes as the World Wrestling Federation themed WrestleMania 7 around the land of the free and home of the brave. The WWF had, in very basic terms here, exploited a war in order to sell a wrestling event, and this risk led to a potential stadium venue getting downgraded to an arena. The Slaughter vs Hogan angle did not pay off in the end, and the end result is a WrestleMania venue that failed to to impress in comparison to previous WrestleManias. Nonetheless, Vince McMahon still hyped up the main event at the beginning of the broadcast like only Vince McMahon can do. Willie Nelson came out like a walking advertisement for WWF merchandise to sing America the Beautiful, and WrestleMania 7 was underway. Slaughter and Hogan cut promos before their main event match. Slaughter talked about how he was the WWF champion so Hulk Hogan would have to play by his rules. Absolutely no mention of the war here by the way. And Hulk Hogan, well the Hulkster calls himself New Technology, saying that this is the Hulk Hogan of 1991 and he and the Hulkamaniacs have secret weapons to take down Sergeant Slaughter. The men make their way to the ring, Hogan waves old glory and it can't be denied that Hogan was still immensely popular at this point. The match is all about Hogan overcoming the cheating tactics of Sergeant Slaughter and General Adnan at ringside. Hogan is very much in the driver's seat for the first portion of the match, however Slaughter turns things around when the Hulkster goes to the top rope, leading to Hulk taking the Ric Flair bump. With Slaughter in control, Hogan takes an absolute beating in the ring. The Hulkster gets hit with a steel chair and he gets choked out with cables on the outside of the ring. Strangely, Earl Hebner doesn't call for the bell and the match continues. Hogan gets hit on the head with the steel chair, leading to the Hulkster getting colour. And this gives us a classic visual when Slaughter applies the camel clutch. Hogan won't surrender, so Slaughter tries to pin Hogan with the Iraq flag, but Hogan kicks out and rips the flag up. Hogan then hulks up, big boot, leg drop, and we have a new WWF champion. This match gets destroyed by fans online, and I don't understand why. I know it's predictable, and I know Slaughter certainly isn't Andre the Giant or Randy Savage. The match isn't a pretty showcase of athletic ability, but in saying that, I still think it's a fun main event. The audience went nuts for Hulk Hogan. There was a great atmosphere in the arena, and Slaughter was vicious during this showdown. I feel the whole Slaughter storyline and character overshadows WrestleMania 7 here, and I also think people skip past this WrestleMania because, on paper, Sergeant Slaughter vs Hulk Hogan doesn't have the same appeal as maybe Hogan vs Savage or Hogan vs Warrior. If you haven't seen it, give it a chance, and if you haven't seen it in a long time like myself, give it another go. The audience helps create an exciting atmosphere for this one, and as predictable as a Hulk Hogan WrestleMania victory is, at least this one played out in a very different way in comparison to previous WrestleManias. WrestleMania 7 then closes with another feel good moment. America has risen to the top once again, and Slaughter would need to regroup. After Mania, Colonel Mustafa, who we all know as the lovable Iron Sheik, would join forces with Sergeant Slaughter. And Slaughter, Adnan and Mustafa would continue feuding with the Hulkster. The feud ended at SummerSlam 1991 when Hogan teamed up with the Ultimate Warrior, defeating Slaughter, Adnan and Mustafa in a handicap match. 
That'll do it for today's video. The next Hogan video will look at Hogan's journey towards WrestleMania 8, along with his match with Sid Justice. As mentioned earlier, WrestleMania 7 is kind of overshadowed by the controversy surrounding Sgt. Slaughter, and maybe it's justified too. The WWF weren't the only media outlet who exploited war for viewership gains, but at the same time, the WWF were, and still are, an easy target thanks to the whole scripted nature of the wrestling business. Did Vince McMahon learn his lesson? No, he didn't. Nothing is really off limits in terms of sensitive storylines within the WWE, and if Vince McMahon feels it will bring in a number, then nothing is off the table. The WWF felt WrestleMania 7 could be a record breaking show at one point, and because this didn't happen, and because of the overall reviews of the event, it's easy enough to see that the WWF would probably consider WrestleMania 7 as a failure. The company would need to regroup, it's time to try something new, and a particular styling and profiling WCW superstar coming into the World Wrestling Federation could be the answer Vince McMahon needed. At WrestleMania 6, Hulk Hogan dropped the WWF Championship to the Ultimate Warrior, and at WrestleMania 7, Hulk was able to reclaim the belt after defeating Sgt. Slaughter in the main event. We talked last time about the decision to put the title back on Hogan, and really, we struggled to think of a good, concrete reason as to why the Ultimate Warrior wouldn't go into WrestleMania 7 as the WWF Champion to square off against Randy Savage. In the end, I concluded that Vince McMahon must have felt that Hulk Hogan vs Sgt. Slaughter in the main event spot would bring in more viewers, with the title being on the line of course. Hulk's journey to WrestleMania 8 would be much more convoluted than previous years though. It seemed like the WWF weren't prepared to once again put all their eggs into the Hulkamania basket, as it was understood that Terry Bollea wanted to focus more on his acting career and so the company needed to build even more main event stars. There was, of course, also the option of bringing in main eventers from other organisations to expand the WWF's roster, and this is exactly what would happen. Not only would the WWF sign some big names, but Vince McMahon was able to sign one of wrestling's biggest drawing superstars of the National Wrestling Alliance in the summer of 91. The nature boy Ric Flair was coming to New York, and due to some curious events, Flair was arriving to the WWF with the NWA World Heavyweight Championship. The dream match of Hulk Hogan vs Ric Flair though wouldn't take place. A ton of different reasons have been given as to why this didn't happen, but let's forget about what the WWE have told us and look into Hogan's real journey towards WrestleMania 8. Some could consider this as the beginning of the end for Hulkamania. Immediately following WrestleMania 7, the Hulk Hogan vs Sgt. Slaughter match was taken on the road. Those who have watched previous Hulk Hogan videos in this series would know that this was kind of standard after WrestleMania. The big matches of the pay per view would get brought to smaller arenas so fans who watched the matches on TV could see the rematches live and in living colour. Right up until SummerSlam 91, Hulk Hogan pretty much exclusively worked with Sgt. Slaughter, and at the SummerSlam event, the Hulkster teamed up with the Ultimate Warrior to defeat Slaughter, Colonel Mustafa and General Adnan. There was turmoil behind the scenes at SummerSlam though. The Ultimate Warrior had threatened to no show the event if Vince McMahon didn't pay him an additional half million. Vince paid Warrior and then he suspended him immediately afterwards. Warrior felt the suspension wasn't justified so Jim Hellwig quit the WWF following the SummerSlam pay per view. There was so much going on though at SummerSlam 1991 that would help shape the future of the WWF in both the short term and and long term. Bret the Hitman Hart won his very first singles championship at the event in a well received match with Mr. Perfect, pretty much stealing the show thanks to both men's athleticism and selling abilities, something that was seriously lacking in the main event picture. Speaking of the main event, a special referee was appointed for the match. New WWF signee Sid Justice, formerly known as Sid Vicious in WCW, was responsible for calling the match right down the middle as Big Sid was brought in initially as 
a baby face. Finally, at the SummerSlam pay-per-view, we saw Bobby Heenan running around backstage with the NWA and WCW big gold belt. Heenan had displayed the title on television before SummerSlam, claiming that the real world's champion Ric Flair was on his way to the WWF and the Nature Boy wanted to challenge the WWF champion, Hulk Hogan. I've talked about Ric Flair's arrival to the WWF in 1991 previously. I find this series of events so fascinating that I even uploaded an entire video based around Flair and the big gold belt, but I can't really move forward in this video without talking about the subject again. Ric Flair was arguably the biggest NWA superstar of the late 70s and 80s, and just after Vince McMahon had unleashed Hulkamania at the very first WrestleMania pay-per-view, rival promoter Jim Crockett had consolidated various NWA member promotions that he owned, resulting in Crockett controlling the majority of traditional Southeast and Midwestern territories. Crockett was attempting to do what Vince had just done. Crockett wanted to expand into a national promotion, and while Vince McMahon selected Hulk Hogan to lead the charge for the WWF, Crockett handpicked Ric Flair on his side. To mark the occasion, the traditional NWA championship belt, better known as the Domed Globe or the Ten Pounds of Gold, that belt was replaced by what we know now as the Big Gold Belt. Ric Flair was the first man to hold this new championship belt after the Nature Boy successfully defended the NWA title against Barry Windham at the appropriately named Battle of the Belts 2 show held in February of 1986. Flair would go on to drop and regain the title over the years, though after winning the title from Sting in January of 91, Flair was recognised as both the NWA champion and the WCW World Heavyweight champion, the big gold belt was subsequently used for both accolades, so if you held the big gold belt, you were the WCW and NWA champion. Interestingly, Flair lost the NWA title but kept the WCW title when he wrestled Tatsumi Fujinami in the Tokyo Dome. Fujinami wasn't recognised as the WCW champion because he backdropped Flair over the top rope during their match, a move that was cause for disqualification under WCW rules at the time. Flair won the NWA title back at the first Super Brawl show in a rematch with Fujinami, but still, I find all this stuff extremely fascinating. Anyway, to get back on track a little, Flair got involved in a contract dispute with WCW President Jim Hurd. Hurd wanted Flair to not only take a pay cut, but Hurd also wanted Flair to get a haircut, call himself Spartacus, and begin working lower on the cards because Ric Flair was apparently yesterday's news. Flair disagreed with Jim Hurd's demands and general assessments of the Nature Boy character, leading to Flair getting fired and his WCW title getting vacated. Remember, the big gold belt represented both the WCW and the NWA champion. Flair was still recognised as the NWA champion and he still had possession of the belt. WCW and Jim Hurd tried to get the belt back, but the NWA champion paid a 25 grand deposit when winning the gold. Flair was owed that money and he wasn't prepared to send the belt back until he got his money back. Interest also built up over time, Flair said in his defense definitive collection DVD that it ended up being around 38 grand. Ric Flair couldn't legally show up in the World Wrestling Federation straight away, but the big gold belt could. So the Nature Boy sent the title belt to Stamford and Bobby Heenan showed it on WWF programming. Heenan would say that the Nature Boy was coming to the WWF, the real world's heavyweight champion was finally arriving in New York, and wrestling fans around the world believed they would finally see the ultimate dream match. NWA champion Ric Flair versus WWF champion Hulk Hogan. It just made too much sense. Sense. It was the shot in the arm the WWF needed at the time. Surely Flair vs Hogan would main event WrestleMania 8 and this would result in one of the biggest buy rates in WrestleMania history. Sid Justice vs Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania 8 had been the original plan from the beginning, but the arrival of Ric Flair along with Sid getting injured meant that original plans would get reconsidered. At one time backstage, the definite plan was to move forward with Ric Flair vs Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania 8. 
People have struggled over the years to try and piece together the booking decisions leading up to WrestleMania 8, and there has never been a solid, clear answer as to why the Hulk Hogan vs Ric Flair match didn't take place. Company men and WWE documentaries lead us to believe that the Ric Flair vs Hulk Hogan house show matches didn't draw big enough audiences, and the matches were also stale. Others believe that Hogan and Flair wouldn't agree on a finish, and others claim that Vince McMahon just didn't want Ric Flair vs Hogan headlining the biggest show of the year. Before going into this further, let's look at what happened on TV. At the Survivor Series pay-per-view, Hulk Hogan dropped the WWF Championship to The Undertaker, Ric Flair caused Hulk Hogan the title due to interference, and so we had a new heel champion in the World Wrestling Federation. Hogan reclaimed the title a week later at the This Tuesday in Texas show. The quick title change, I believe, was done for two reasons. Firstly, the prospect of Hulk Hogan regaining the title at this Tuesday in Texas would help sell an experimental pay-per-view being held on a Tuesday night, something the WWF hadn't done before. The WWF wanted to maximise numbers here, and this is evident when you consider how much the this Tuesday in Texas pay-per-view was promoted during the Survivor Series. The Taker vs Hogan rematch was even announced at the Survivor Series show. Secondly, the WWF needed to get the belt vacated before the 1992 Royal Rumble, and they needed Flair to go into WrestleMania as the champion. I'll explain why this was necessary a bit later. So just to stick with what was going on on TV, Hogan lost the title at Survivor Series, he regained the title back at this Tuesday in Texas, but due to Ric Flair's interference and the mess that was created at the end of the Taker vs Hogan match at this Tuesday in Texas, the WWF title was vacated by WWF President Jack Tunney and it was decided that the winner of the 1992 Royal Rumble would be named the new WWF Champion. Ric Flair won the match. By this time, the dispute over the big gold belt had ended with the NWA, so the belt was sent back and Flair was now the WWF Heavyweight Champion. Of note though is that Sid Justice returned from injury at the Royal Rumble show also. Sid eliminated Hulk Hogan from the Royal Rumble match, but Hulk ended up grabbing Sid's arm on the outside of the ring, allowing Ric Flair to eliminate Sid Justice and win the WWF Championship. It was a strange piece of match booking here. Sid had eliminated Hogan fair and square, and in the original pay-per-view feed, you can hear fans cheering when Hogan got eliminated. The WWF made audio edits to the Royal Rumble replay and the Coliseum video releases, even adding in additional commentary from Gorilla Monsoon to try and portray that Sid had wrongfully sneaked up on Hogan, and the Hulkster's reactions afterwards were justified. So Flair was the WWF champion, and Sid Justice and Hulk Hogan were now beginning to feud with each other with Sid slowly turning into a bad guy, even though Hulk's actions on TV made him look like a total heel, but anyway. It was soon announced that Ric Flair would not wrestle Hogan at WrestleMania 8. Instead, Ric Flair worked with Randy Savage in an admittedly excellent match while Hogan faced Sid in the main event of the evening. While Flair and Savage had an excellent build-up towards their match involving Miss Elizabeth and her alleged relationship with the Nature Boy, Hogan and Sid's story was all about Sid turning his back on the Hulkster. Jack Tunney announced Flair vs Hogan at a press conference for WrestleMania 8. Sid got upset with the decision, and when Sid completed his heel turn by leaving Hulk Hogan on the February 8th, 1991 edition of Saturday Night's main event during their tag team match with Flair and The Undertaker, it was decided then that Hulk Hogan would instead face Sid at the WWF's biggest show of the year. Hulk Hogan vs Sid at WrestleMania 8 is one of my least favourite WrestleMania main events. I just feel the two men didn't work very well together and this was seriously highlighted thanks to Flair and Savage going on earlier in the broadcast. Along with this you had Roddy Piper vs Bret Hart for the IC Championship at WrestleMania 8, a well received bout that showcased the athleticism of Hart and the storytelling capabilities of Piper. By the time Sid and Hogan came to the ring for the main event, it felt like we had already seen the best the company had to offer. 
offer. Not only did the WrestleMania 8 main event plod along, but the finish was completely botched. Papa Shango was supposed to interfere when Hogan delivered the leg drop, but poor Charles Wright didn't make it to the ring on time, resulting in Sid actually kicking out of the leg drop, and Harvey Whippleman, Sid's manager, jumping on the apron. This led to a disqualification. It was a mess and it was bad, though the fans were treated to the return of the Ultimate Warrior at the end of the show. Warrior came back to help out the Hulkster, closing WrestleMania 8 with a feel-good moment for those in attendance. The WrestleMania 8 main event was billed as possibly Hulk Hogan's last ever match, and for a while, it was. Hulk Hogan suddenly disappeared from WWF television screens for around 10 months following WrestleMania. And this brings us back then to the reasons why Flair didn't wrestle Hulk at the WWF's biggest show of the year. Just to confirm, Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan did indeed work a series of house show matches at the end of 1991 and the beginning of 92. It's been reported that Vince McMahon was expecting sellouts for house shows featuring the Flair vs Hogan match, but attendance was just above average. As mentioned earlier, it's also been said that the two men didn't work well together and the matches were flat. These have been the main reasons given by the WWE as to why Flair and Hogan didn't wrestle each other at WrestleMania 8. It at least through their documentaries and WWE books and whatnot. When you look deeper though, the thing that the WWE will never talk about are wellness violations and scandals. Put two and two together here and the booking decisions surrounding WrestleMania 8 becomes a little more clear. Hulk Hogan appeared on the Arsenio Hall show in the summer of 1991, just before his SummerSlam 3 on 2 match. Arsenio had previously talked about a doctor being convicted for supplying sportsmen with steroids without prescription. Hulk Hogan's name was on a list of customers. Hogan would go onto the show to defend himself, saying what was reported in the newspapers wasn't true, while reminding viewers that the media had put a dark cloud over the Hulk Hogan character, a character that was supposed to be family friendly friendly and a character who stood up for what was right. The thing is though, is that Hulk Hogan was lying here. He was lying through his teeth and we know that because of the 1994 Vince McMahon court trial. Not only was Hulk Hogan lying, but he was doing a really bad job of it. He must have used the word basically around 20 times or more. He talked so much with such discomfort that it felt like a nervous plea for people to believe him. The whole thing just didn't come across well on TV screens. The Arsenio Hall interview did no favours for Hulk Hogan nor the WWF, and with the media breathing down Vince McMahon and Hulk Hogan's necks with exposés and damning news articles, the decision was eventually made to get Hogan away from WWF screens. Hogan can make movies, he can make TV shows, or he can get endorsements, but Vince McMahon did not want Hulk Hogan on WWF programming following WrestleMania 8. Vince knew that Hulk Hogan sold WrestleMania tickets, but when the show was over, Hogan should lay low for a while. So this means that Hogan can't become the WWF Champion, he wouldn't be there to defend the title after Mania. Ric Flair can't beat Hogan for the title at WrestleMania either because at that time, a heel wrestler typically didn't win the WWF Championship at WrestleMania, plus you have Hulk Hogan maybe refusing to lose to Flair on the big stage. Also, Ric Flair was not a Vince McMahon creation and we all know Vince doesn't like putting over things that weren't built via the WWF machine. There's no doubt in my mind that if Flair vs Hogan did happen at WrestleMania 8, then the only outcome would be Hulk Hogan getting the win. But anyway, with all of this in mind, it begins to make sense as to why Hogan worked a non-title main event to close Mania. Get the match done, get the warrior back to fill the void, let the fans go home happy. And yes, replacing Hogan with warrior here may sound stupid for a company trying to deflect juicing allegations, but the media weren't gunning for the warrior nor was Jim Helwig's name mentioned as a customer. Flair, a much physically smaller wrestler than Hogan, can lose the title in the middle of the card to Randy Savage, Vince McMahon feeling here that the reputation of the WWF was maybe more important than the prestige of the world title, probably rightfully so.
Funnily enough, Sid Justice got busted on a wellness violation shortly before WrestleMania, and he was fired after the annual European tour that follows Mania. The plan was for Warrior to work with Sid, but that didn't happen. With Hulk Hogan gone, more emphasis was put on smaller or more athletic superstars of the WWF. Bret Hart would eventually become the WWF champion, highlighting the WWF's desire to wave their arms around as if to say, hey look, we have smaller guys that are successful too. Still, the allegations and the scandals wouldn't go away just by removing Hulk Hogan for a little while. When Vince understood that there was no getting away from this and he would have to go to court, Hulk was eventually brought back for WrestleMania 9 and the ultimate snub took place when Bret Hart, a guy who had carried the WWF during the height of the allegations, was forced to give up the WWF championship and watch the title go back to Hogan. Ric Flair, meanwhile, felt he didn't belong in the WWF during the company's push towards the new generation. And an initiative that was born out of necessity due to the juicing allegations, and the Nature Boy left the World Wrestling Federation at the beginning of 1993, going back to World Championship Wrestling and receiving a warm welcome upon his return. Hogan vs Flair was a match that we were maybe robbed of. Wrestling fans wanted to see it, and even die-hard NWA fans were intrigued to see what would happen, but a series of events led to the biggest match in WrestleMania history not happening. Hulk was leaving, the feds were coming after the WWF, the match didn't go as well as expected at house shows, and WrestleMania history has taught us, at the time at least, that Ric Flair winning at WrestleMania against Hulk Hogan in a WWF title match was incredibly unlikely anyway. The only way Hogan vs Flair could have happened at WrestleMania 8 was if Flair, a cornerstone of the NWA, ended the WWF's biggest annual show holding the WWF title with a victory over the WWF's Golden Boy. It just wasn't meant to be. Of course, Hogan could have won the match and forfeited the title the next week, but the WWF had already screwed around with the championship so much since Survivor Series that the belt was already becoming a bit of a joke. At the same time, it just didn't make any sense for Hogan to beat Flair and then disappear afterwards. The WWF had invested a ton into Ric Flair's arrival and making him lose to a guy who wouldn't be around for nearly a year would have been incredibly short-sighted. And so we got what we got. There were no issues placing the title on Randy Savage because the Macho Man would still be around afterwards, and so Ric Flair vs Randy Savage at WrestleMania 8 was a really really good match, so it wasn't all doom and gloom. Our last video looking at the entire career of Hulk Hogan ended at WrestleMania 8. The Hulkster took part in the Mania main event, working against Sid Justice while the WWF title was defended in the Ric Flair vs Randy Savage match. After WrestleMania 8, Hulk Hogan completely disappeared from the WWF, the wellness scandals were hitting the World Wrestling Federation at full force, and Hulk Hogan felt that now would be a good time to get out of the WWF and once again put all of his focus on Hulk. Hollywood. Hogan had a real desire to make movies and become a big Hollywood star, and with the feds coming down on the World Wrestling Federation in a big way, there was really no better time for the Hulkster to get out and try to make movies. Along with this, the Hulk Hogan character in wrestling had become stale, Hulkamania had slowed down as the 90s progressed, and it's evident that Vince McMahon was in search of a new top guy to carry the company forward. With the scandals going on, Vince would begin moving the company in a new direction, and just when we thought Hulk Hogan was yesterday's news, the Hulkster was once again brought back into the World Wrestling Federation at the beginning of 1993, and he was pretty much handed the WWF title, infuriating guys who had carried the company on their shoulders during Hogan's absence, in particular one Bret the Hitman Hart. Today's video will look at Hogan's 1993 WWF run, a strange story indeed that even to this day is still hard to make sense of. Now, just ahead so what we'll do here is look at everything that happened on TV first of all so we have a clear timeline of events and then we'll go back and try to piece everything together and try to understand why certain decisions were made. Most of the information we know about the WrestleMania 9 debacle and Hogan's exit comes from producers who are now in the podcast industry and we also have a lot of information from Bret Hart too but we also have to take everything with a pinch of salt. No one is really going to know the true ins and outs of this story other than Hulk Hogan and Vince McMahon, and both men have been relatively quiet about this period of the Hulkster's career. So now that that's out of the way, let's begin our look at Hulk Hogan in 1993. 
So let's check out what happened on TV first of all in chronological order. Brutus the Barber Beefcake made his in-ring WWF return on the 15th of February 1993 episode of Monday Night Raw, taking on Ted DiBiase of Money Incorporated. Money Inc, managed by Jimmy Hart, were the WWF Tag Team Champions at the time. They were one of the WWF's main heel tag teams. And if you want to learn more about DiBiase and IRS in the WWF, you should see a link on the screen right now to check out a video I made on Money Inc. Anyway, Brutus Beefcake ended up getting his face smashed in with a briefcase. Brother Brutus had previously taken time away from the WWF to have his face reconstructed after a parasailing accident, so Brutus getting his face smashed once again was supposed to be a big deal. Jimmy Hart showed concern for the barber. Jimmy had mostly been associated with heels in the World Wrestling Federation, so it was quite odd to see him being so sympathetic towards a good guy. The following week on Raw, Hulk Hogan Hogan would be in the building and he'd be addressing what happened to his friend Brutus, but it's the pre-recorded sit-down interview that took place earlier in the broadcast that's way more interesting. Hulk Hogan was coming back and before getting in the ring, Vince McMahon and Hogan decided they would address the wellness allegations on WWF television. Hulk Hogan said, when you're at the top of any field, whether it be business, entertainment, sports or sports entertainment, there's a lot of curious people who want to dig into your past and find out what you're all about. Well, when they dug into Hulk Hogan's past, they found out that Hulk Hogan is a human being. Hulk Hogan is not afraid to admit that he's made mistakes. On a personal level, I've made mistakes. On a business level, I don't always make the right decisions. And even on a peer pressure level, from when I was growing up through the 60s, 70s and 80s, I made mistakes too. We're in the era of the 90s and notwithstanding the legitimate media, there's a lot of tabloid terrorism going on out there. These are the people who dwell on the negatives and dig up any dirt they can. Even if the allegations are false, they report them anyway and they don't care who they hurt as long as they personally gain from it. But thank god the Hulkamaniacs aren't all about that, we dwell on the positives. You have to consider how this interview would have came across to younger fans who couldn't have cared less about the news and those young fans who wouldn't know what a wellness violation was. Hogan was admitting to making past mistakes and there were plenty of fans who still saw Hogan as an all-American good guy, yet here he was tearing down the media on a WWF TV show while admitting he has faults, something that we never would have seen during the mid to late 80s. It's an interesting piece of raw history that nobody talks about. About. Anyway, the Hulkster came out of the ring later on. The first thing he wanted to address was the attack on his good friend Brutus Beefcake, and Hogan said that he was going to get revenge for Brutus by going after Money Incorporated. Brutus came to the ring showing off his battle scars, and Jimmy Hart was also brought down to the ring, a now babyface Jimmy Hart. Together, Brutus Beefcake and Hulk Hogan were known as the Mega Maniacs, and with the Mouth of the South as their manager, the Maniacs were going after Money Inc. and the tag team titles at Rest. WrestleMania 9. To be fair, I thought this was initially a great spot for Hogan to be in. I was glad that the Hulkster wasn't pushed straight back into the title picture, and if Vince McMahon felt that the star of Hulk Hogan wasn't shining as bright as what it once did, then it made sense to keep Hogan out of the title picture and let others have that spotlight. Bret Hart was our WWF champion at the time. The Hitman was on a mission to prove that the future of the WWF should be centered around athleticism and having good matches night after night. Brett wasn't about being larger than life, Brett could be considered the complete opposite to Hulk Hogan when we consider WWF champions of the 90s. Yokozuna had won the 1993 Royal Rumble and so the big man was getting a title opportunity at WrestleMania. Yokozuna had made his WWF debut at the end of 1992 and while he did fit the usual evil foreigner gimmick that Vince McMahon seems to love, there was no doubt that Yokozuna was a standout wrestler in his own right. Of course he had that incredible size but Yokozuna could also work around the ring, he understood his size was his greatest strength and so Yokozuna's matches throughout the 
the first few years of his career were always quite the spectacle. The hitman Bret Hart had gained a huge following over the past year or so. The excellence of execution was on a different level when it came to in-ring storytelling. He had an excellent look that really fit in with early 90s WWF and the hitman gained a certain amount of respect from the fans that differed greatly from past WWF champions. The fans of the World Wrestling Federation admired Bret Hart's in-ring abilities and this admiration helped Bret capture the WWF title. There was also the wellness scandals that kinda pushed Vince McMahon into putting the belt on a smaller superstar, but anyway, Bret Hart was very much accepted as a high caliber WWF champion. Yokozuna had been dominant up until WrestleMania 9 and it did feel like the hitman was going to get seriously tested on the WWF's biggest show of the year. Before the title match took place at Caesars Palace, the Mega Maniacs lost their tag team title match against Money Inc via disqualification. Placed right in the middle of the WrestleMania 9 card, Money Inc vs the Mega Maniacs ended when Hulk Hogan used Beefcake's protective mask as a weapon. Jimmy Hart tried to become the ref during the bout but an official ref came out and disqualified the Hulkster. Towards the end of the pay per view and just before the Bret Hart vs Yokozuna match, Hulk Hogan cut a promo where he said he just came from Bret Hart's locker room and he could see that Bret was ready to go. Hulk says that Bret is a Hulkamaniac and the hitman should keep his eye on Mr. Fuji during his match with Yokozuna. Hogan then issued a challenge to the winner of the match, whether it's Bret Hart or Yokozuna, a match we assume would be at a later date. Hogan then implied that Yokozuna would take the belt to Japan, but Bret would make sure the title stays in the United States. Keep this in mind, it's important later. Most of you will know the story here, Mr. Fuji ended up throwing salt in Brett's eyes while the hitman had the sharpshooter locked in. This allowed Yokozuna to defeat the hitman and become the new WWF champion. This was the first time a heel won the main event at WrestleMania and it also ensured that the WWF had a new supervillain right at the top of the WWF ladder. But wait, Hulk Hogan comes down to check on Brett, Mr. Fuji challenges Hogan to step into the ring right there and then for a WWF title match. Brett hams it up as if to say go get him Hulkster. Hogan gets in the ring and around 15 seconds later Hulk Hogan is the new WWF champion. Now we'll come back to this later but yeah Hogan ended up leaving WrestleMania 9 as the new WWF champion even though he hadn't been officially advertised for a WWF title match and also after only working two matches in around a year the first was a house show tag team match against Money Inc and the second one was the tag team match at WrestleMania 9. To to say some people were pissed off would be a huge understatement. After winning the WWF title, Hogan didn't defend the belt at all until the 1993 King of the Ring. He didn't even defend it on house shows. The Money Inc vs Mega Maniacs match was put on the road instead while the WWF title played second fiddle. One of the most prolific matches of this time period though happened a month after WrestleMania. Hulk Hogan went over to New Japan Pro Wrestling to face the Great Muda in a special WWF Champion vs IWGP Champion match. Remember earlier when Hogan was afraid that Yokozuna would bring the WWF title to Japan? Well, here's Hulk Hogan bringing the belt to New Japan Pro Wrestling. Hulk Hogan even called the WWF Championship a toy and a stepping stone towards the IWGP Heavyweight title. Hogan tried to say that his interview where he said this was mistranslated, but he actually spoke these words on TV in English. Hogan naturally felt that his comments in New Japan work wouldn't make it far past Japanese audiences, but wrestling Wrestling tape traders have existed for just as long as what VCR recorders have. Plus today we have the internet available that has helped on more than one occasion to call out Hogan bullshit. Hogan defeated Muda at Wrestling Don Taku 1993 in an entertaining match, it's a real curiosity for sure and it's another match where you get to see Hogan wrestling at his full ability. After his WWF run came to a close in 1993, Hogan went back to New Japan where he once again defeated Muda, this time 
Muda was working under his real name, Kijimoto, and the Hulkster and Muda teamed up on the CMG1 Climax Special to defeat the Hellraisers too. Anyway, let's go back to the States. That toy WWF title wasn't defended once until the King of the Ring pay-per-view. Hogan didn't work any singles matches and it's all very peculiar to say the least. The Hulkster didn't even show up on Raw, he was featured in a bunch of pre-tapes, one of these was even from the set of Thunder in Paradise, and it really makes you wonder why the WWF even bothered putting the title on Hogan if he wasn't going to be around following WrestleMania. It makes you think that WrestleMania's ending was a quick fix. Anyway, at the King of the Ring in 1993, Hulk Hogan dropped the title back to Yokozuna after a dodgy cameraman shot a fireball onto Hogan's face from his camera. It sounds ridiculous, but this is exactly what happened. Hogan's face was burned and this gave Yokozuna an opportunity to score the pinfall win. The strap was taken off the Hulkster and it was placed back on Yokozuna. And so, Yokozuna would begin a lengthy run with the WWF Championship. Many people think that this was the end of Hulk's run here in the WWF and while we wouldn't see him on TV, he did work a house show series against Yokozuna around Europe. WWE producer Bruce Prichard was convinced that Hogan didn't go on this tour, but we have data and even video proof that Hogan was still in the World Wrestling Federation following the King of the Ring. The final date we have for Hulk Hogan in 1993 is the 6th of August. Hogan defeated Yokozuna via disqualification like every other match on this tour. Afterwards, it was reported that Brutus Beefcake, Jimmy Hart and the Hulkster all pulled out of their future WWF dates. All men were still under contract, but all men decided to sit at home. Hulk did have those aforementioned New Japan matches though, but there was no other wrestling dates until 1994. Okay, now we know what happened on TV, let's rewind back and try to make sense of the things that happened and why certain decisions were made. Firstly, Hulk Hogan's return at the beginning of 1993. You'd put this down to Vince McMahon simply not wanting a WrestleMania without Hulk Hogan. Hulk's acting career wasn't really taking off at the time, and the opportunity to come back into the World Wrestling Federation with minimal dates, a large payday, and a chance to win the WWF title once again was probably attractive enough to bring the Hulkster back into the company. Hulk disappeared previously due to the juicing scandal, so let's bring Hogan back and the very first thing he can do is address the fact that he made mistakes and it will all be forgotten. Next up, why did Hulk Hogan have to win the WWF title at WrestleMania? Well, I think we answered that already. Vince just wanted it, it was a bonus for Hulk coming back, and WrestleMania's typically ended with the victorious good guy providing a feel-good moment to send the crowd home happy. The bigger question then is why couldn't Bret Hart just defeat Yokozuna to gain the same audience response? Well, Hulk Hogan at the time was the stuff of WWF legend, while Bret was still really carving out his own legacy in the company. I certainly don't agree with Hogan winning the belt at WrestleMania 9, and I really think the WWF could have done better business down the road had Yokozuna defeated Bret, and then the hitman got his revenge at a later date. But Vince McMahon was falling back on what had brought him so much success in the past, and that was Hulk Hogan winning at WrestleMania. Bret got a little comfort by getting promised a WWF title match against Hogan at SummerSlam 93, where Bret would defeat the Hulkster and so the torch would be officially passed, but that obviously didn't happen. Bret wrote in his book that promotional photos were taken with the Hitman and the Hulkster to promote their SummerSlam match, apparently they were standing in between the WWF title and a tug of war pose, but it was all for nothing. Bret was, and still is, seriously pissed off at how things played out here. Bret thought Hogan was being selfish by not returning the favour, and I do believe that Bret got the short end of the stick here, seeing as he had broke new ground in the WWF by becoming a champion who relied on his in-ring skills more so than being an over-the-top cartoon character. Bret wanted change in the World Wrestling Federation, and it seemed like Hogan had swooped in and wrecked everything that Bret had worked for. 
You then had Yokozuna, this fierce upcomer who was making headlines as a top bad guy in the World Wrestling Federation. We make a big deal of how Bret Hart felt about WrestleMania 9, but we never consider Yokozuna. The guy had just won his first WWF Championship at WrestleMania. It should have been his moment, and the last picture we saw of WrestleMania 9 should have been that of Yokozuna standing over the fallen hitman. But that moment and lasting picture was also taken away when Vince McMahon went back in time to deliver another Hulk Hogan WrestleMania celebration. Granted, Hogan's crowd reaction after winning the championship at Mania 9 was incredibly good. The crowd in attendance thought it was great, and you can't really take away Hogan's pop at all, but it's cheap and hollow. It won't last, nor will Hulkamania carry the company for months to follow. There's no forward planning at all. It's an end of WrestleMania, really, and that's it. Long term, I personally feel that Yokozuna winning would have been the best for future matchups, and if that wasn't possible, then Brett winning to give that feel-good moment would have held more long-term weight. Hulk Hogan, out of all three options, would have been my last choice, but hey, it's all up for you to decide. Even Hogan celebrating with the Hitman after Brett successfully defended the title could have got the desired audience response, but anyway, it really doesn't matter now. As for the King of the Ring, the photographer Harvey Whippleman, you'd think that he would get revealed later down the road and Hulk Hogan or even Jimmy Hart would get some revenge here, but that was quietly shut down and the photographer angle went completely quiet. It's been said that Hogan decided to leave the WWF because business had gotten bad. His house show tag team matches against Money Inc. had drew poorly. Pay-per-view buy rates during late 1992 and 1993 had declined since the glory days of the mid to late 80s. And the Hulkster once again felt that he could make it in Hollywood. Vince McMahon later said that Hogan had told him that he was officially retiring. But Vince was also under the impression that Hogan would eventually return. Just like he had done at the beginning of 1993. Hogan though truly thought that the Thunder in Paradise show was going to be a huge hit. His head was in Hollywood and being a star on syndicated TV. Mr. Nanny was also scheduled to get released and for whatever reason the Hulkster felt his chances of further big movie roles was inevitable. Keep in mind too that if the WWF was tanking while Hogan was at the forefront then some Hollywood producers might have felt that Hulk Hogan wasn't the draw that he once was. But if Hogan wasn't there and those ratings were declining, then Hogan could always say that he's the one who brought in the big numbers for the World Wrestling Federation. This leaves us with the impression that Hogan coming back for WrestleMania is quite a shrewd business move on Hogan's behalf. And so, for a while, Hulk Hogan did indeed stay retired, but as we all know, a meeting with Ric Flair and Eric Bischoff would change all of that in mid-1994. Vince McMahon, now understanding that he's lost Hulk Hogan, maybe went into panic mode when he tried to build himself a new All-American hero. Lex Luger was given the opportunity to fill Hulk Hogan's boots and become the number one star of the company, the big babyface that would move the WWF into the next era, but Lex Luger did not live up the expectations. Try as they might, the WWF noticed that Lex Luger was no Hulk Hogan, and so the company fell back on Bret Hart once again. The Hitman defeated Yokozuna at WrestleMania 10 in 1994, while Luger's push was brought to a screeching halt. This wouldn't be the last time the company fell back on Bret Hart either. It happened after Diesel's WWF run in 1995. Still, as mentioned earlier, Bret never did forgive Hogan for setting out SummerSlam 93 and robbing the hitman of that Hart vs Hogan match. And I do feel it's a shame too. We instead got Lex Luger vs Yokozuna and we all know how that turned out. So in the end, when all is said and done and with the general narrative that's been pushed around WrestleMania 9 in this time period of the WWF, Hulk Hogan has came out of this 1993 run looking incredibly bad and it's very difficult to see it any other way. Hogan was looking after himself in many ways and when Hulk saw wrestling more as a lucrative business during this time in his career, you can see that the Hulkster was wanting to ensure that he remained relevant. If that meant taking the title at WrestleMania and ditching the company months later to have another go at making movies, then so be it. 
People see it as selfish. Hogan saw it as doing what was best for Hogan. Yokozuna ended up getting his title run in the end, but again, it's a shame his WrestleMania moment was taken away. And as for Bret Hart, well, Bret Hart became a legend in his own right without needing the Hogan match in the World Wrestling Federation. It would have been nice if it happened, but you have to imagine that the match would have ended in some sort of quick roll-up, or there would have been some sort of bullshit interference that gave us the impression that Hogan didn't really lose. It would have been good to see Hogan vs Hart, but then again, when you really think about it, you can probably make a good guess of how the match would have played out anyway. It can't be overstated just how big of a deal it was when Hulk Hogan jumped ship to WCW. Hogan had created more than a legacy in the WWF, he was arguably bigger than the company itself, and the thought of Hulk Hogan working for the WWF's main competitor of the 90s sounded totally insane. Hogan had it good in the World Wrestling Federation, his contract was steady and his merchandise flew off the shelves, but by 1993, Hogan also felt he could do more outside of wrestling. The WWF itself was moving in a different direction, leading to younger and more athletic superstars being put at the forefront, and Hulk Hogan and Vince McMahon had contrasting ideas when it came to moving forward with the Hulk Hogan brand. Along with this, Hulk Hogan had been offered a TV acting role in the Thunder in Paradise show. Thunder in Paradise was produced by the same team who worked on Baywatch, and Hulk Hogan felt that this new role could be his big break into acting, a more lucrative and safe journey than that of a WWF superstar. WWF TV producer Bruce Pritchard said, In our opinion, he was counting his chickens before they hatched, but that's where his head was. His head was in Hollywood. He was thinking he could become a big syndicated TV star and he wouldn't have to wrestle anymore. Vince McMahon said, Hogan stated that he would never compete against me. He wanted out of his contract, so I said okay. I think part of that was certainly on me and my view of his career as well. I felt like he had reached his zenith. Hogan's final WWF date of 1993 has been the subject of debate, but all signs point to Hogan wrapping things up in August of 93 after a European tour. This would have been around two months after his last WWF televised match against Yokozuna at the 93 King of the Ring. In September of 1993, Hogan returned to New Japan Pro Wrestling for two matches, the first being a tag match where Hogan partnered up with the Great Muda to take on Road Warrior Hawk and the Power Warrior, and he also defeated Muda in his second match during this stint. This Muda vs Hogan match was a rematch from their May 1993 WWF Champion vs IWGP Champion encounter, and at the very beginning of 1994, just as a quick side note, Hogan also defeated Tatsumi Fujinami in the Tokyo Dome. So, Thunder in Paradise then. The show was originally filmed at St. Pete Beach in Florida, but eventually, production moved over to Disney World in Orlando. Disney's Hollywood Studios was used as a main location, while scenes were filmed around the Disney World Resort. As fate would have it, Eric Bischoff and WCW were also filming their weekly TV tapings at Disney's Hollywood Studios, at the very next soundstage as a matter of fact. Ric Flair has been credited as the man who set up the meetings between Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff. Hulk Hogan said, on the soundstage next to us was Ted Turner's WCW. The next thing I know, this guy named Eric Bischoff started coming over to me and he began bringing Ric Flair with him. He kept telling me, hey Hulk, we want you to come back and be a part of wrestling again. I said no way, but this went on for a good 5 or 6 months. I missed wrestling so much that finally I caved and I went to work for Ted Turner. 
Of course, money also played a big part in the signing of Hulk Hogan to WCW. I've went over the lucrative deal Hogan signed in the past, but in short, Hulk Hogan's contract was one of the best contracts not only in wrestling, but in all of sports and entertainment. Hogan had a great downside, but his bonuses and incentives were just flat out crazy. If people tuned into WCW and people bought the pay-per-views, Hogan stood to make an incredible amount of money. I'm sure Hogan missed wrestling, but he gave up the acting dream at the drop of a hat once he got that lucrative offer from Ted Turner and Eric Bischoff. To mark the occasion, WCW had a Hulk Hogan parade in Disney's Hollywood Studios. So there's a little backstory, so let's get into the nitty gritty and look at Hogan's WCW matches. Initially, Jimmy Hart was by Hogan's side during his early WCW days too, so Hogan must have worked out a pretty sweet deal for the mouth of the south also. Eventually, the booty man, or brother Brudai, or Brutus Beefcake, whatever, he would also join Hulk Hogan's side. Hogan showed up then at Clash of the Champions 27 in grand style, arriving in a white limousine with a police escort. What you have to keep in mind though is that Clash 27 was held in South Carolina and fans would know that the Carolinas were pretty much flair country. Hulk Hogan then, the big WWF star, was going into enemy territory here in his very first appearance and you can definitely hear some boos when he and Jimmy Hart step out of the limousine. Now to be fair, there were also a lot of cheers for Hogan too, but it wasn't the huge ovation that Hulk was accustomed to. If you want an idea of how much WCW were willing to push Hulk Hogan early on, he was featured in no less than four segments during this entire broadcast, with his final segment featuring a challenge for Ric Flair's World Heavyweight Championship. Flair had just defeated Sting on this very same night, so yeah, Hulk Hogan's very first match in WCW would be for the World Heavyweight Championship, and of course, Hulk Hogan also won the match. Hogan didn't need a long build up, he didn't need a program to ease him into the title picture, no, straight in and take the title, just like that. Again, to be fair though, the crowd's reaction to Hogan winning the title here was thunderous at Bash at the Beach 1994, though it was held in Florida and not Flair Country. Hogan's next appearance for WCW happened just a month later at Clash of the Champions 28, and boy oh boy, first of all, WCW promoted the Hulk Hogan Hotline, a premium phone number where you could take part in Hulk Hogan trivia and get a special message from Hulk Hogan himself. Right after this, Mean Gene Okerlund was scheduled to interview Hulk, but the Hulkster was attacked by a man wearing a mask. Keep in mind, Hogan also had a championship defense later in the night against Ric Flair. The next 10-15 to 15 minutes of the broadcast was just Hogan receiving medical attention, and then after the next match, Hogan was shown getting brought into a hospital as Eric Bischoff said the attacker had snapped something in Hogan's leg or knee. Throughout the show, we were given updates on Hulk Hogan's condition multiple times, and Ric Flair came out to tell Hogan he had to forfeit the championship. When it was time for the Flair vs Hogan match, Hogan had made a miraculous recovery and the match went on as planned. Hogan lost via countout when Sherry attacked him with her shoe, and then the masked man came to the ring to help Flair beat up Hogan. Sting came to the rescue, and we went off the air. Following this show, WCW booked the 1994 Hulkamania tour in Europe, where Hogan defeated Ric Flair in every match they were booked in. The next big pay-per-view was Halloween Havoc 1994, and again we had Flair vs Hogan in the main event. This steel cage match though was also a retirement match, and we all know how retirement matches go in wrestling, but still, here we are. Mr. T also served as the special referee for this match. Anyway, this match got pretty chaotic, with Sting making an appearance, Sherry getting involved inside the cage, the masked man making another appearance. It was a bit messy for sure, and not a match that I can recommend. Hogan gets the pinfall win, and after the match, the masked man once again tried to attack Hogan. Hogan got the upper hand and removed the mask, and lo and behold, it was Brother Brudai all along, Hogan's coattail rider himself. Avalanche and Kevin Sullivan came to help Brother Brudai attack Hogan, leading to Sting again coming out to save the Hulkster as the show went off the air. 
So Kevin Sullivan, Avalanche and Brother Brudai, who would soon become known as The Butcher, formed the Three Faces of Fear. The team were defeated at Clash of the Champions 29 by Hulk, Sting and Dave Sullivan, and at Starcade 1994, Hogan defeated The Butcher in the main event of WCW's biggest yearly show. You can see here then that since Hogan made his way to WCW in mid-94, the company done nothing but push him to the moon. People say that the NWO's arrival in 1996 changed the landscape of WCW, and it definitely did, but Hogan done the same thing here in 1994 when he debuted. He was the centre of attention on every WCW show that he appeared in. Anyway, also at Starcade, Big Van Vader bumped into Hulk Hogan backstage, telling him he was coming for the Hulkster's WCW Championship. Macho Man Randy Savage made his way to WCW in December of 1994 and he would quickly align himself with Hulk Hogan, having saved the Hulkster from the three faces of fear towards the end of Starcade. Savage and Hogan defeated Kevin Sullivan and The Butcher at Clash of the Champions 30 and after the match, Big Van Vader showed up to powerbomb the Hulkster and Hogan no sold the move. Vader's finisher, a move that had devastated opponents around the world, and Hogan no sold it. This would set up the main event at the next big show, Super Brawl 5, a world title match pitting Hulk Hogan against Vader. Hogan won via disqualification at around the 15 minute mark, but Vader returned the favour to Hogan when he no sold the leg drop and kicked out at 1. This started a match series between Vader and Hogan that lasted for months, with rematches happening at Uncensored 1995 and Bash at the Beach 95. However, Hogan defeated Vader in every match they had together. The Uncensored match between Hogan and Vader was atrocious. This was booked as a classic strap match where the winner had to touch all four corner turnbuckles to get the victory. During the match, Ric Flair interfered, the same Ric Flair who Hogan had retired months earlier. Hogan ended up getting the strap on Flair and he dragged him to all four corners while touching the turnbuckles. Somehow, this counted as a victory for the Hulkster, so Vader didn't even technically lose this match. This main event also saw the debut of the Renegade character in WCW. You can learn more about that in my previous Renegade video. Randy Savage and Hulk Hogan defeated the reinstated Ric Flair and Vader at Slamboree in 1995, and after this, the Vader vs Hogan feud had ended with Hulk clearly getting the upper hand at every meeting they had. I feel this was a mistake. If there was a heel on the WCW roster who could take down Hulkamania, at least for a little while and his name wasn't Ric Flair, then it was definitely Vader. However, WCW were all too happy to continue pushing Hogan, with no one seemingly being able to touch him. In saying this, with the exception of the strap match, I feel the Hogan vs Vader matches are still worth watching, just because it really did feel like Vader could have defeated the Hulkster at certain points of the feud. Anyway, moving on, the Three Faces of Fear were revamped into the Dungeon of Doom, a stable seemingly made just to feud with Hulk Hogan and bring an end to Hulkamania. At Fall Brawl 1995, the Dungeon of Doom were defeated by the team of Hulk Hogan, Lex Luger, Sting and Randy Savage in a War Games match, one of the least memorable War Games matches in WCW history. I should also mention that in the same month that Fall Brawl 1995 occurred, WCW officially launched Nitro, their new Monday Night TV show. Hogan appeared on the first two episodes with victories over Big Bubba Rogers and Lex Luger. So Halloween Havoc 1995 was next in, yeah, this is what many remember from this era of Hulk Hogan. The Giant had made his WCW debut as the kayfabe son of Andre the Giant, a moniker that was quickly dropped but anyway, the Giant would be getting his hands on Hulk Hogan at the Halloween Havoc pay per view. Before their match, in a pre-taped segment that would air on the Halloween Havoc show, the Giant and Hulk Hogan faced off in a monster truck match, basically a sumo match held on the arena roof involving monster trucks. Mr. Eric Bischoff himself must have thought that wrestling fans would automatically love monster trucks, but anyway. After Hogan won the match, the Giant came after Hogan, which led to the Giant falling off the side of the building. 
Now, this type of fall would probably mean the giant would be no more. I mean, who could survive such a huge drop from an arena building? But nope, the giant just walked on out for his match with Hogan later in the evening, and he won the WCW Championship. If Hogan got disqualified during this match, he would lose the WCW Championship, and this is exactly what would happen after Jimmy Hart hit Hogan with the championship belt and joined forces with the Dungeon of Doom. After the match, the Yeti came to the ring and helped the giant put Hogan in a double bear hug, resulting in one of the most awkward looking spots in the history of professional wrestling. In the end, due to Jimmy Hart's interference, the title ended up getting vacated and put up for grabs in the very first World War III match, and Randy Savage won the match and the championship. Hogan was involved in the World War 3 match and he didn't get officially eliminated, still the referees assumed Hogan was thrown over the top rope when they saw him on the outside and Savage was given the win. Just before the World War 3 match, Hogan had a match with Sting on the November 20th 1995 edition of Nitro, a forgotten match here in the Sting vs Hogan saga. The match went to a no contest. Super Brawl 6 saw Hulk get a little revenge on the Giant when he defeated him in a steel cage match, and after this, Hogan made his way to Uncensored 96 to take part in one of the most infamous matches of this WCW era, the Doomsday Cage Match. Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage took on Ric Flair, Arn Anderson, Meng, the Barbarian, Lex Luger, the Taskmaster, Zeus, working here as Zed Gangsta, and the ultimate solution, and with these odds placed against them, Savage and Hogan still won the match. An 8 on 2 handicap match, and Hogan and Savage won, unreal. The 8 man team were dubbed the alliance to end Hulkamania, and they still couldn't get the job done. Now, the triple deck doomsday cage was a great visual for sure, but the whole thing was a mess. Hogan and Savage would have to fight their way from the top section through to the two middle sections and then they would have to wrestle their opponents on the ring that was on the bottom section. Pretty much a gauntlet match where Hogan and Savage would work their way down the cage, needing to score pinfalls or submissions in order to move on to the next tier. But it was brutal, especially on the upper decks of the cage where the wrestlers fought each other very gingerly. And the match got particularly bad in the last tier when Hogan and Savage battled Solution and Gangsta. It's one of those things though that still needs to be seen. As bad as it is, it's become a talking point over the years when discussing bad WCW matches. I really wish there was something good I could say about this match, and I guess the concept in the cage itself looked pretty good, but in execution, this was one of WCW's worst ever main events, in my opinion. Hogan would then have two matches on two separate episodes of Nitro in April of 96. The first saw him team up with the reborn brother Brudai, working now as the Booty Man, in a winning effort against Arn Anderson and Kevin Sullivan. On the 15th of April, Hogan defeated Arn Anderson and Kevin Sullivan in a handicap match, so who needs the Booty Man anyway? Hogan would not make any further in-ring appearances for WCW until the summer of 1996, when he showed up at Bash at the Beach and made history alongside WCW newcomers Kevin Nash and Scott Hall. So from the Doomsday Cage match to the forming of the NWO mere months later, you can definitely tell here that Hulk Hogan knew he had to make a change. It's interesting though to look back at Hulk Hogan before the NWO and how he won match after match, and even after turning heel, this is a trend that would continue. Yes, there were a few bumps along the way, but by and large, Hulk Hogan was unstoppable in WCW when it came to his win-loss record. Anyway, you can continue on with Hulk Hogan's WCW career by checking out my Hulk Hogan NWO Year 1 video, a video that directly follows what happens next in Hogan's career. Looking back here, the thing that stands out the most really is how hard Hogan was being pushed. WCW really did bat high on Hulk Hogan becoming a success in WCW, and over and over again, they would book him into winning situations. If Hogan ever lost a match, it was due to outside interference or something that was totally out of Hogan's control, and I just feel this didn't help him get over at all with the traditional WCW audience. 
WCW diehards knew what was happening. They were watching this big WWF guy come in, take the title in his first match and completely steamroll the opposition, and many fans didn't like it. In the summer of 1996 then, turning Hulk Hogan heel would be the absolute best thing to do for so many reasons. The Hulkamania stuff was becoming stale, the true traditional fans of WCW didn't want to cheer him, and the landscape of professional wrestling was quickly shifting into a more contemporary product. If Hogan went another two years in WCW with the yellow and red, being the white meat babyface and all that, then it's hard to imagine him surviving in the company. Thankfully though, Hogan put on the black and white, and soon enough, the New World Order were positioned to change the entire wrestling world. In today's video, we're going to take a look at Hulk Hogan's first year in the New World Order. Hulk Hogan by far is the most requested superstar on this channel, and I feel that making a one and done video for Hulk Hogan would be both impossible and unfair. The man means so much to wrestling and has done so much during his active years that I feel the best thing to do would be to look at certain time periods of his career. Hogan will appear on this channel at different times, we won't spend weeks on Hogan because, well, although he is the most requested superstar, not everyone wants to see consecutive videos for weeks based on one guy. So let's start at one of the more interesting time periods for Hulk Hogan, the first year of the extremely successful and lucrative New World Order in WCW. In the summer of 1996, Hulk Hogan was able to reignite his career when he became a bad guy in wrestling. For over a decade, the Hulkster had been telling us to eat our vitamins and say our prayers as he portrayed the all-American hero on television screens to great success. Hulk was smart enough to notice that times had changed even by mid-1996, people were getting tired of the same old Hulk Hogan, and people were now starting to get behind the concept of cool villains in wrestling. Hogan's audience receptions, before becoming a bad guy, had been good but nowhere near as great as what they once were. I don't think Hogan would have ever faded in the obscurity had he not joined the New World Order, but I do agree that Hulk Hogan and the red and yellow stuff was getting quite tiresome. You have to understand that Hogan did not have to join the NWO in order to remain financially stable within WCW. Looking over Hogan's contract at the time, we can see that the guy was making serious money from the day he joined the company. What is interesting though is Hulk Hogan's WCW incentives, his bonuses within the company. In the most basic terms, Hogan got 15% of pay-per-view buys as a financial bonus, and if buy rates were particularly high for WCW domestic pay-per-views, Hogan got paid even bigger amounts of money based on the success of each individual show. Hogan also got 25% of ticket sales for every Nitro and Thunder show that he appeared in with a guarantee of no less than 25 grand per show. So it's clear that it was in Hogan's best interests for people to attend shows and buy pay-per-views at home. And while gambling on the NWO wasn't a necessity, you can see that Hulk stood to make much more money if he and WCW was a success. When fans were getting tired of Hulkamania, you best believe he would hitch a ride with the NWO in hopes that shocking the world and becoming a heel would make people tune into WCW shows and buy pay-per-view shows, but still, the decision to turn heel didn't come easy to Hulk Hogan. Hulk was, and still is, very aware of how lucrative the Hulk Hogan brand is. During his time in the WWF, the man became a household name, and even still in the mid-90s, his name carried weight. 
Hogan had been smart and savvy enough to protect the Hulkamania image both on a commercial level and by making sure he'd done what was right for Hulk Hogan in the ring, and if he were to turn into a bad guy, there was a serious threat there that this very image would be somewhat cheapened. The decision that Hulk Hogan had to make was, in very simplified terms, based on risk versus reward. Does he risk the Hulkamania empire for the possibility of higher pay bonuses with WCW while adding a new layer to his character? Or does he keep the red and yellow image and mildly successful endorsements simply coasting along and collecting guaranteed money? To put it in perspective, Kevin Sullivan revealed that Hulk Hogan's agent, Peter Young, cried, actually cried, on the phone to him until 2.30 in the morning that WCW should not and could not turn Hulk Hogan heel. Scott Hall and Kevin Nash arrived in WCW in the summer of 1996, claiming they were in World Championship Wrestling with the intention of taking over the company. Hall and Nash had been successful in the WWF as Razor Ramon and Diesel, and they said they had another partner who would be revealed at WCW Bash at the Beach 96. Rumours were rampant of who the third man could be, with Sting, Bret Hart, and even Davy Boy Smith being names that seemed to constantly creep up. Scott Hall said, we had no idea who it was going to be. The whole third guy thing came up by accident. I remember Kev and I called Brett and I spoke to him. Kev spoke to him and we told him it was really fun working at WCW. It was really laid back, guaranteed money, it was easy. We were so used to being in a shark tank in New York. Coming to Atlanta was like being in a country club. It was really tame in the locker room in WCW compared to New York. We told Brett he should come down. Bischoff was interested, he was offering him a pretty sweet deal but Brett wasn't interested. We wanted it to be Hulk, but Hulk had creative control in his contract so he didn't have to do anything he didn't want to do. We went to the ring, we hadn't even met Hulk yet, I met him briefly at Wrestlemania 9 but I didn't know Hulk. We actually went to the ring in Daytona and Hogan wasn't even there yet. He was on a jet, flying cross country from shooting a movie. Bischoff wanted it to be Hulk before we went out. Bischoff told us, if Hulk doesn't show, I'm gonna send out Sting. Going back a little, Eric Bischoff revealed in his book that he had meetings with Hulk in Hulk's home regarding the Hulkster becoming the third man in the New World Order. Hogan apparently wasn't sold on the idea initially, mainly due to being the good guy in wrestling was what gave him his fame and fortune. Bischoff left Hogan's house without a straight answer and it was days later when Hogan picked up the phone and confirmed to Eric that he was in, he was going to turn heel. As Scott Hall mentioned, Eric was still wary of Hogan changing his mind or not even showing up at Bash at the Beach, so if Hogan didn't show or if Hogan changed his mind, Sting would have been the third man. Crazy to think that even if a plane was delayed or if Hogan slept in that day, then the future of WCW would have looked way, way different. Eric Bischoff said on his 83 Weeks podcast, I think at the time, probably a week before Bash at the Beach, is when I started letting people know about Hulk. I think I let Kevin Nash know. I know I was out in Los Angeles doing something because we met for a beer at Sunset Boulevard at some biker bar. I wasn't sure if it was going to be Hulk Hogan or Sting. One was plan A and the other was plan B. I tried to let Kevin know how much he should know, and the other part was because I was worried he would leak it out, so it was probably a week before I let those that needed to know, know that Hogan was going to be the third member. So Hogan made it to Bash at the Beach and turned into a bad guy. Against his agent's wishes, Hulk Hogan felt that this could be the shot of adrenaline his WCW career needed. Hogan stood in the middle of the ring and called the fans trash while reminding them that they turned their back on Hulkamania. When he walked out wearing all black on Nitro, it really hit home for a lot of people that the unthinkable had happened. The American hero of wrestling wasn't a hero anymore. He had a real disdain for some of the fans that hung on to his every word back in the 80s and early 90s. Needless to say, Hulk Hogan turning heel and forming the New World Order with Kevin Nash and Scott Hall was the right move. 
Hogan became not only relevant again, but he became the talk of the entire wrestling industry. And you gotta think that Hulk Hogan, now known as Hollywood Hulk Hogan, was thinking of his bank balance as the headlines came rolling in from the wrestling magazines at the time. His mission now was to stay relevant while hoping that WCW shows would sell out and people would buy the pay-per-views at home. His financial interest in the success of WCW was just too great to ignore. So let's do what we normally do and take a look at the matches Hogan had during this time period. Hogan's very first match as the leader of the New World Order happened at WCW Hog Wild in 1996 where he defeated the Giant for the WCW Championship. This also saw the championship getting the NWO spray paint job for the very first time. The match is a slow paced affair, a lot of holds here which makes things a little flat. It is interesting though to watch Hogan work as a heel here after being such a huge draw as a babyface, so for this reason, the Hog Wild Championship match is still worth a watch. The outsiders interfered to give Hogan the upper hand, and Mr Brutus Beefcake, the booty man, Ed Leslie himself, got dropped by the NWO when he tried to present Hogan with a birthday cake. Hogan's first title defence was just 5 days later at Clash of the Champions 33, a match that saw the Hulkster defend the championship against nature boy Ric Flair. This one doesn't even reach the 10 minute mark and it was a little rough around the edges. When you watch this one you will quickly realise why this match isn't talked about all that much. Hogan even does his classic hugging up routine during this match as a heel, which made fans cheer for him. Definitely a bad move here, but anyway, the outsiders hit the ring and attack Flair, leading to the Horseman, Sting and Lex Luger running down for the save. This led to Hogan's next match in the NWO, a war games match at Fall Brawl 1996. Hogan, Hall, Nash and the bogus NWO Sting defeated Arn Anderson, Lex Luger, Ric Flair and the real Sting in a good war games match that's definitely worth your time. I feel it was after the War Games match that Hulk Hogan finally became comfortable as a heel. His promos got better in the ring and his moveset changed also to complement his Hollywood Hogan character. It took a while, but Hogan had been so used to working as a babyface that sometimes he would still mount Hulkamania style comebacks and try to work from underneath. By the time Hogan got to his next match with old enemy and friend Macho Man Randy Savage, he had fine tuned his heel persona, but admittedly, this match here really wasn't that good. The Hogan vs Savage Halloween Havoc match in 1996 should have been spectacular, but it turned out to be one of those big fight feel main events that kinda falls flat at nearly 20 minutes long. Hogan also decided to wear this wig, which has become meme worthy today, but those who followed WCW back then would remember that Hogan had mocked Savage about going bald in the build up to this match. Pot calling the cat all black here for sure, but this was the reason why Hogan was wearing the wig, it was to make fun of Savage. Without the context, some people seem to think that this was Hogan actually trying a new look for himself. Anyway, the wig was soon removed during the match, even Randy Savage himself put it on for some giggles, and those who take the time to watch the match will know it was simply used as a gag. The match ends with shady referee Nick Patrick and the Giant making sure that Randy Savage has no chance of becoming the WCW Champion. This wasn't WrestleMania 5 by any means and if you want to see Hogan vs Savage, I'd recommend going back to 1989. After the match, Roddy Piper makes an appearance to set up the next big Hogan pay per view match. Two men who were in the WrestleMania 1 main event are going to square off at Starcade 1996. Before we get to Starcade though, I should mention that Hulk Hogan defended the WCW Championship against Lex Luger in a dark match on the 11th of November edition of WCW Nitro. Piper vs Hogan then at Starcade. We all blindly assume that this match, the main event of Starcade 1996, which was billed as the match of the decade, would be for the WCW Championship. It wasn't. WCW never said it would be a championship match, but then again, they also didn't say that it wouldn't be for the WCW Championship either. We had no reason to think that Piper vs Hogan wouldn't be for WCW's top prize. Piper defeated Hogan and got a huge pop in the process, but the following night on Nitro, Hogan and Bischoff acted like the match never happened. How can he spread out here and show his face after what happened last night? 
Starcade 1996's main event was a complete throwaway match which, in Hogan and Eric Bischoff's minds, meant absolutely nothing. We won't get into the ins and outs of Starcade 1996. There's a story here that I'm sure could take up the remaining time on this video, but Piper vs Hogan at Starcade 96 is something I will come back to in the future. The New World Order had become so big by this point that Eric Bischoff felt the faction could become its own brand, and to test the waters, the NWO had their first pay-per-view in January of 1997. NWO sold out. Hogan defended his title against the Giant, a man who had left the NWO following some disagreements with the faction. This one was actually pretty good, the crowd was very much behind the Giant here, but the ending again saw dodgy referee Nick Patrick help protect Hulk Hogan. As the New World Order came to the ring to destroy the Giant, the crowd loudly booed the finish and chanted, We want Sting. On the very next episode of Nitro, we have the first televised Nitro match featuring Hulk Hogan since he had joined the NWO. Isn't that crazy when you think about it? Hogan had went from July 1996 all the way to the beginning of the new year without wrestling a single match on WCW's flagship TV show. Hogan worked a total of 11 Nitros in 1996, and every one was before the NWO even existed. When looking at match histories, you will also notice that while in WCW, Hulk liked to work the majority of his contracted Nitro dates in the first half of the year, seemingly getting these out of the way. This could also be poor foresight by Eric Bischoff too, but who knows. Of course, Hogan still showed up on Nitro and sometimes even got physical, but he was not obliged to work additional matches after he had wrestled the agreed amount in his contract. Additional matches would cost WCW additional money. Anyway, Hulk's first Nitro match of 1997 saw him lose to the Giant by DQ, and yes, the NWO interference is what led to the disqualification. Roddy Piper, the man who defeated Hulk at Starcade in a non-title match, got a chance to win the gold at Super Brawl 7 when he faced Hogan once again. Of course, Hogan won this match and capped his WCW Championship. After Team NWO defeated Team Piper and Team WCW at Uncensored, Hulk Hogan performed in a rare house show match where he put over hometown hero Jacques Rougeau in Montreal, Quebec. It was a non-title match of course, and the match is available in its entirety on YouTube. Hogan then used up more of his WCW Nitro dates by wrestling on the show two weeks in a row. Lex Luger defeated Hogan on the 9th of June episode, and the following week, Lex Luger and the Giant defeated Hogan and Dennis Rodman by disqualification. A quick match here which was done to get some last minute sales for the next pay per view, Bash at the Beach. Bash at the Beach 1997 was also the one year anniversary of the NWO formation and the main event was once again the Giant and Lex Luger taking on Dennis Rodman and Hulk Hogan, a match that Hogan and Rodman lost. For those unaware, Dennis Rodman was brought into WCW with the sole intention of getting the company more media attention. He didn't care about wrestling at all but also he couldn't turn down the money that was offered. In total, Dennis Rodman earned over $1.5 million for the dates he worked for WCW over 1997 and 1998. And so this ends year one of Hulk Hogan in the NWO. Remember those bonuses and incentives that were written into Hulk's contract? Well, let's just say that WCW became extremely successful during this time period. The New World Order became the hottest thing in wrestling, more people tuned into Nitro, more people bought the pay-per-views, and more people attended shows. WCW was gearing up for Starcade in 1997 which would feature Hulk Hogan vs Sting in the main event, and thanks to the build-up for this particular match, Starcade would also be the most financially successful pay-per-view in WCW's history, and if WCW was financially successful, so was Hulk Hogan.
Today we're going to continue on with the Hulk Hogan series here on Wrestling Bios. We're now in the middle of Hogan's WCW run. It's the summer of 1997 and the Hulkster has just teamed up with Dennis Rodman at the Bash at the Beach show in a losing effort against the Giant and Lex Luger. Let's pick it up from here then as Hogan's lucrative time in the New World Order continues. The night after Bash at the Beach, Lex Luger challenged Hulk Hogan to a future WCW title match. Hulk Hogan wasn't in the building, he had the night off, but it looked like WCW was going to go with a Lex Luger vs Hulk Hogan main event at the next pay per view, Road Wild. Hogan formally accepted Luger's challenge the next week on Nitro. The Hulkster said he would break Luger in Sturgis as he lay down in the middle of the ring with Eric Bischoff by his side. Before getting to Road Wild though, we need to stop off at the August 4th 1997 edition of Nitro, the special 100th edition of the landmark Monday Night Wrestling show. To celebrate the occasion, Nitro ran for three hours, and to pop a rating and to get fans to tune in, it was decided that Hulk Hogan would defend his title against Luger. Keep in mind that Road Wild was happening later in the week, Hogan vs Luger was still booked for the pay per view, so fans were going to see the total package vs the Hulkster twice in one week. In the Nitro main event, Lex Luger put Hogan in the torture rack and Hogan submitted. That's right, Hogan lost the WCW Heavyweight Championship to Lex Luger on a weekly wrestling show. The crowd response was absolutely insane here too. It's one of the better moments in Nitro history and after winning the WCW title, Luger took the belt backstage where the NWO spray paint was removed from the Heavyweight Championship. If we knows Hogan like we knows Hogan, then the smart money says that the World Heavyweight Championship was going straight back to the Hulkster at Road Wild. And of course, this is exactly what happened. Luger's big moment on Nitro was completely negated when the Hulkster won the title back in Sturgis. A fake sting cost Luger the championship in a pretty mediocre match, and the ending of Road Wild 1997 left a really sour taste as fans realised that Luger's title win was empty and and pointless. Say what you want about Lex Luger but he was over during this time period. Even a month or two with the world title would have sufficed but after all was said and done, we were right back to where we started. At this point, WCW was looking forward to Starcade and the in-ring return of Sting. JJ Dillon had been offering Sting match contracts that JJ felt would appease the Stinger, but Sting only wanted to face one man, and that was Hulk Hogan. Eric Bischoff wanted to build the inevitable match as slow as possible, and in order to do this, Hogan would have to face other opponents in the run-up to Starcade. Immediately following Road Wild, Hogan didn't work a single televised match until Halloween Havoc 97, and even then, the WCW title wasn't on the line. Everything was secondary here when compared to the Hogan vs Sting rivalry, and I just want to point out that I'm not bashing the creative decision at all here, it was smart and it was the right thing to do. The WCW title wasn't defended at Halloween Havoc because Roddy Piper was booked to beat Hollywood Hogan inside a steel cage. A bunch of bogus Sting stood around the cage watching the match, and the show ended with Piper taking a beating from both Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage after Hot Rod scored the victory. Hollywood Hogan vs Sting at Starcade was made official during a contract signing held in late October of 97. Fans would have to wait around two months before seeing one of the most hyped matches in wrestling history take place at the Starcade show. WCW World War 3 took place on the 23rd of November 97 and Hulk Hogan was part of the World War Battle Royal. The Hulkster appeared towards the end of the match as a surprise entrant and an elaborate NWO plan led to Scott Hogan Hall winning the Battle Royal. But let's just fast forward to Starcade then, the biggest match in WCW history and a night that would end up filled with controversy. I've talked about this main event before in a previous video and I've gone over the finer details of the match and the build up so I'll keep things as brief as possible here. I'll start by saying that the Hulk Hogan and Sting entrances at Starcade 97 are absolutely phenomenal. The atmosphere in the arena is electric and the whole 18 month build up finally coming to an end really does make for a grand spectacle. I do believe that Sting maybe should have came down from the rafters and I think it was a mistake 
mistake having the Stinger just walk on out there like any other competitor, but still, this didn't stop the Starcade main event from feeling like a really big deal. This type of spectacle is something that WCW struggled to achieve during the mid 90s, but Eric Bischoff and company completely nailed it at Starcade. The term big fight feel is so overused in modern wrestling, and it's a term that's just slapped onto any main event these days, but Sting vs. Hogan really had that big fight feel, and it's hard for me to think of a match in WCW afterwards that had the same energy. When the bell rings though, things begin sinking pretty quickly. I think we all expected more, but in the end, Hogan vs Sting was just passable. Again, I'm not going to go over the details, but Hulk Hogan pinned Sting at the end of the match, and Sting's shoulders were counted to the mat. Bret Hart then showed up and he ordered the match to continue with the Hitman as the new referee. Sting then applied the Scorpion Deathlock, and Sting was crowned the new WCW Champion. It was a mess, Nick Patrick's three count was supposed to be fast, but it wasn't. It looked like Hulk Hogan actually actually got robbed and the match never should have been restarted, but what's done is done. You can learn more about this in my Starcade 97 video, and I'll include a link at the end of the video. The next night on Monday Nitro, the controversy surrounding Starcade was addressed. Hogan argued that Nick Patrick was supposed to be the one and only official involved in the Starcade main event, and Hogan also said that Patrick ordered for the bell to be rung and therefore, the Hulkster should still be the world champion. Sting ended up issuing an open challenge to any NWO member on the same episode of Nitro, and Hulk Hogan accepted the challenge. There was no decisive finish here, Nitro went off the air as Sting hit the Stinger splash, accidentally hitting the referee at the same time. Fans had to tune in next week to see what was going on, and in classic WCW fashion, JJ Dillon said on the next episode of Nitro that fans would need to check out the debut episode of Thunder to get the latest news on the World Heavyweight title. So on the January 8th 1998 episode of Thunder, Sting was forced to vacate the championship. The two men had another match at Super Brawl 8 and Sting was able to defeat Hulk Hogan to once again and become WCW Champion. Randy Savage hit Hulk Hogan with a spray can while the NWO tried to attack Sting, and this led to the Mega Powers exploding once again. Hogan would move into a rivalry with Randy Savage that would eventually lead to the complete split of the New World Order. Randy Savage and Hulk Hogan had been having problems in the run up to Super Brawl, yet Savage remained a member of the New World Order. When Savage cost Hogan the title in the Sting main event, all bets were now off and Hogan wanted to face the Macho Man at the uncensored pay per view inside a steel cage. Billed as a power struggle between two NWO members, Hogan and Savage ended again in typical WCW fashion without a clear winner. The Disciple interfered to help Hogan and this led to Sting coming down to assist Savage, but the Macho Man attacked the Stinger before leaving the cage. This brings us to Spring Stampede then. Hulk Hogan teamed up with Kevin Nash to take on The Giant and Roddy Piper. Kevin Nash had also been having problems with Hogan recently, and this resulted in Hollywood attacking Nash at the end of their tag team match. Later in the evening, Randy Savage had a title match with The Stinger, and thanks to interference from Kevin Nash, Randy Savage became the new WCW Champion. The next night on Nitro, Hogan challenged Savage for the title, saying that Savage and Nash had worked together to keep the belt away from the Hulkster. Even though Kevin Nash got a little payback for the bat attack at Spring Stampede, Hulk Hogan ended up becoming a four-time WCW Champion, thanks to Bret Hart jumping in. This business with Nash and Savage though resulted in irreparable damage being caused to the New World Order, both in storyline and in reality, and this resulted in a splinter group known as as the NWO Wolfpack being formed. Kevin Nash led the red and black version of the NWO while Hogan maintained the black and white faction, and the main storyline that would dominate the coming months within WCW was the war between the NWO Wolfpack and NWO Hollywood. 
Hogan's next big pay-per-view appearance would happen at the 1998 Great American Bash, where Hollywood Hogan would get involved in a star-studded tag team match. Hulk Hogan teamed up with Bret Hart to take on Roddy Piper and Randy Savage. On paper, it's a legendary match, but to be honest, the bout turned out to be quite forgettable. If Bret and Hogan won the match, then Piper and Savage would have to wrestle each other afterwards. Savage ended up submitting to the sharpshooter, and Savage also submitted to Piper's figure four. Could you imagine Hogan topping out twice in one evening? Yeah, I think not. The following month though, Hulk Hogan would drop the WCW Championship on an episode of Nitro in front of 40,000 plus fans. A historic night in WCW history, and a night that many fans say was the true beginning of the end for World Championship Wrestling. WCW Nitro went live on the 6th of July 1998 from the Georgia Dome in Atlanta in front of a record audience. Honestly, it was insane that a weekly episode of Nitro could attract so many people, especially during a time when the WWF was bouncing back. Being in Atlanta, Georgia, a lot of Turner executives were in attendance for this show, and Hulk Hogan decided to drop the WCW Championship in the main event against Bill Goldberg. This was actually a shrewd move on the part of Hogan. The idea here was that Hogan could say that he was the one who sold out the Georgia Dome, and Hogan could say he attracted a record audience, the WCW Nitro, pretty much taking all the credit. Hogan dropped the title to Goldberg in a match that really should have drew more money for WCW through pay-per-view buys, and while the audience reaction was absolutely incredible, and while it's one of the greatest moments in Nitro history, there was a lot of cash here thrown away and it was all for Hogan to look good in front of these Turner executives. Still, Bill Goldberg was now the champion and Hulk Hogan marched on to Bash at the Beach 1998. Hulk Hogan once again teamed up with Dennis Rodman to take on DDP and Carl Malone in a tag team match. The pay-per-view drew a big number thanks to the NBA stars settling their differences within the ring. Getting celebrity involvement was the name of the game once again for the next WCW pay-per-view, Road Wild 98. Jay Leno teamed up with Diamond Dallas Page this time to defeat Hogan and Eric Bischoff in a match that you really don't need to see. With that being said, the WCW and Jay Leno relationship gave WCW even more media exposure, but by this point, the wheels were starting to loosen up a little within World Championship Wrestling. The company decided to bring in the Ultimate Warrior for a match against the Hulkster, taking place at Halloween Havoc 98, but before getting there, Hogan, Bret Hart and Stevie Ray were defeated in a War Games match at Fall Brawl 98. This War Games match was really put together to further the Hogan vs Warriors singles match at Halloween Havoc, which is a shame when you consider how big of a deal War Games used to be. In the weeks leading up to Halloween Havoc, the Warrior played mind games with Hulk Hogan that were both unintentionally hilarious and insanely ridiculous. Warrior had somehow developed supernatural powers and the Hulkster tried to sell all of this like it was legit, but really it fell flat. The Halloween Havoc 1998 main event was absolutely brutal too. Many believe, including Warrior, that Hulk Hogan wanted to gain a victory here in order to get a little retribution for WrestleMania 6, but still, that didn't stop Warrior from collecting a sweet paycheck for very little work. It's a complete mess of a match. Most will recall the botched fireball spot, but honestly, even if this bit wasn't written into the match, it was still a truly awful wrestling bout that left fans shaking their heads in disbelief. By this time, the WWF were firing on all cylinders as the Attitude Era had evolved into a full force movement within wrestling. The WWF now seemed like the edgier and fresher product, while WCW were still giving us things like Hulk Hogan vs The Ultimate Warrior. Hulk Hogan appeared on The Jay Leno Show to announce his retirement from professional wrestling on the 26th of November 98. Hogan and Eric Bischoff announced that the Hulkster was actually going to run for President of the United States, but this was all a publicity stunt that led to absolutely nothing. Meanwhile, Wolfpack leader Kevin Nash had become one of WCW's biggest babyfaces thanks to his work in the Wolfpack, and Kevin Nash was going to go to Starcade 98 to face Bill Goldberg for the WCW Heavyweight Championship. 
Keep in mind that Goldberg was undefeated during this time, but of course nothing lasts forever. The first mistake was maybe putting the belt on Goldberg back in the Georgia Dome, but anyway, Kevin Nash went into Starcade and Goldberg's undefeated streak came to an end. Big Sexy was the new WCW champion and the title now belonged to the red and black NWO. The next title change is still something we talk about today. It happened only one week after Starcade, and many say that the title change that took place on the 4th of January 1999 resulted in the rapid downfall of WCW's popularity. And I'm afraid you're going to have to wait until the next Hulk Hogan upload before learning the entire story. It's been requested time and time again on the channel, and I've decided to cover it in its very own upload. The Finger Poke of Doom will be uploaded very, very soon here on Wrestling Bios. So what can we take away from this upload when we look at Hogan's WCW work from mid-97 to late 98? Well really, it's a political game isn't it? There's no better example of Hogan's shenanigans than the Starcade 97 fiasco, and while the event made Hulk Hogan a lot of money, the controversy surrounding the main event only goes to prove that this was the Hulk Hogan show, not a WCW show. Fans loved Sting, they waited all this time to see the Stinger battle Hogan, and Hogan ultimately decided that the match shouldn't end clean in order to save face. No matter what way you look at it, it's bullshit. It's been said too that the NWO Wolfpack was created due to legitimate heat backstage between Kevin Nash and Hulk Hogan, and if we believe this to be true, then we also conclude that creative differences that likely benefited Hulk Hogan was the reason for this failing relationship. The creation of NWO Wolfpack left Hogan with a very tired and very stale NWO black and white faction that included guys that fans didn't really want to see, especially when compared to the much cooler red and black NWO that eventually added guys like Lex Luger and Sting. The Goldberg match too on Nitro was another mistake, not only for the money that was thrown away, but we all knew that Goldberg's winning streak would now come to an end sooner rather than later. It's been said that the finger poke of doom stemmed from Hogan dropping the belt to Goldberg in the Georgia Dome. The NWO explained that this was a long con to get the title back on Hogan and back where it rightfully belongs, but the fact that the finger poke of doom incident is still talked about today as a low point in WCW really tells you all you need to know. But well, it's my turn now. I'm looking forward to discussing the finger poke of doom incident and looking at it from a more in-depth point of view, so please join me for the next Hulk Hogan video here on Wrestling Bios and I promise it will be available very soon. Take care and thank you for watching. So it's time to do it, it's time to look at the finger poke of doom in WCW. This video will be a continuation of my Hulk Hogan series here on the channel, but it will also serve as a standalone upload. You won't need to watch the previous video because I'll go over some details again in this upload so you have a full picture of what happened. I'm going to go over today's subject in two parts. We'll first look at everything that happened on TV, and then we'll look at how the finger poke of doom incident affected WCW and try to make sense of why the incident happened. Also, I should point out that the reporting around the finger poke of doom is extremely varied. In researching today's subject, I found numerous contradictions. Books have been written where facts have been twisted to make things seem a little more glamorous or stories have been told that don't match up with dates or numbers, things like that. I've done my best here in weeding out the nonsense. Anything that hasn't been proven has been left out. So, for example, the day of WCW book by Artie Reynolds and Brian Alvarez, all the content within those pages is pretty much second or third hand information. Nobody was in direct contact with Turner Broadcasting when that book was put together so there's no point in using it as a reference. The content of this video, excluding any opinions I may have, will be from employees who were actually in WCW when all of this went down. So let's get to it then, this is the finger poke of Doom and WCW. 
During mid-1998, the New World Order faction in WCW had split in two. There was the NWO Black and White, led by Hulk Hogan, and there was the NWO Wolfpack, led by Kevin Nash. The NWO storyline had been a major success for WCW after the summer of 1996, but by the time we got to mid-98, things were getting a little stale. The group had expanded in a big way, and this led to the overall impact of the New World Order getting watered down. The NWO Wolfpack did freshen things up a little and fans were receptive to the red and black version of the NWO, but the New World Order in general felt like a tired idea that WCW was running into the ground. On the flip side of this, 1998 was a pivotal year for the World Wrestling Federation. WrestleMania 14 had ushered in the Stone Cold era, with Steve Austin becoming the WWF Champion, and Vince McMahon had decided to update his wrestling organization to a much more contemporary product. The WWF were were full of fresh ideas while WCW were seemingly stuck with the NWO in their main event picture. There was an exception though, there was one man who was making a lot of noise in WCW, he had no affiliation with the NWO, he wasn't an old WWF guy, and he was booked in such a unique manner that fans had no option but to pay attention. That man was Bill Goldberg. Goldberg seemingly done the impossible in 1998 WCW. He was able to break into the main event scene while guys like Kevin Nash and Hulk Hogan were at the top of the mountain. On the July 6th, 1998 episode of WCW Nitro in front of a record audience inside the Georgia Dome, the undefeated Bill Goldberg became the WCW World Heavyweight Champion after defeating Hollywood Hulk Hogan. This ended up being the single most profitable episode of WCW Nitro ever, and it's a real moment in WCW history that you just have to see for yourself. Words can't do it justice. Something I'd like you to keep in mind throughout the entirety of this video though is that Hulk Hogan signed a new contract with WCW shortly before this episode of Nitro, so the creative control clause was also kept intact. This is important and we'll circle back to this later. With the world title now on Goldberg, Hulk Hogan would shift his focus onto other competitors such as the Ultimate Warrior, and the Hulkster would eventually tease a retirement from wrestling while running for president. Starcade 1998 was headlined by WCW Champion Bill Goldberg versus Wolfpack leader Kevin Nash. After a little assistance from Disco Inferno, Bam Bam Bigelow and Scott Hall and his trusty taser, Kevin Nash done the unthinkable, he ended Goldberg's winning streak. Many fans today question this decision and again we'll talk about this in the second half of the video, but it's insane how many people bash this outcome without watching the footage. The audience inside the MCI Center in Washington DC go absolutely crazy when Nash wins the belt. Granted, fans are probably cheering due to the shock of seeing Goldberg take his very first WCW loss, and empty pops like this evidently don't mean a lot in the long run, but for all the complaints directed at Kevin Nash due to the Starcade 98 finish, no one can say that the crowd weren't extremely excited when Goldberg got beat. So to keep the timeline of events fresh, NWO Black and White leader Hulk Hogan was the WCW champion going into the Georgia Dome on the 6th of July 1998. He was defeated by the unbeatable Goldberg on a live episode of Nitro and Goldberg became the champion. And then on the 27th of December 1998, NWO Wolfpack leader Kevin Nash beat Goldberg, ending Goldberg's run as WCW champion and also ending Goldberg's long winning streak. Nitro was in Baltimore the next night and Kevin Nash was annoyed that his win at Starcade had an asterisk beside it thanks to Disco Inferno and Scott Hall getting involved. Big Sexy came to the ring and he announced that Goldberg will get his rematch the following week on Nitro which, ironically enough, would be inside the Georgia Dome, the same venue where Goldberg won the title from Hulk Hogan back in July. So we arrive at the 4th of January, the very first Nitro of 1999. During the first half of the show, Bill Goldberg got arrested. We didn't know what the charges were, but it looked like the Nash vs Goldberg match was in jeopardy. Kevin Nash was visibly upset about this turn of events, while Hulk Hogan, who was scheduled to make an appearance on Nitro, seemed pleased with what happened. Hogan said that if Goldberg was a criminal, then he deserved to go to jail. Remember, Hogan was doing his phony presidential campaign during this time period. As it turned out, Miss Elizabeth was accusing Goldberg of stalking her. 
her. Kevin Nash came out of the arena saying that if Miss Elizabeth is behind Goldberg going to jail then Hulk Hogan is obviously pulling the strings. Nash asks Ric Flair, the WCW president at the time, for a warm up match against Hogan. Nash said that Goldberg would get cleared before the end of Nitro and the Nash vs Goldberg rematch will still happen later in the night, but Big Sexy wants a piece of Hulk Hogan in the meantime. Ric Flair agrees, so the fans in attendance are kind of expecting two Kevin Nash matches on Nitro this evening, and the WCW title would be on the line in both matches. Hulk Hogan comes out for an interview and he agrees to the match also, saying that he's going to beat Kevin Nash while retiring from wrestling as the world champion. After the promo, Tony Schiavone told fans what was going to happen over on Raw in the main event. Tony told WCW viewers that Mick Foley was going to win the WWF title and he sarcastically said that that should put a lot of butts in seats. We'll come back to this a little later too. Miss Elizabeth admits that she made the accusations up and Bill Goldberg arranges a drive back to the Georgia Dome. Meanwhile, it's time for Hogan vs Nash. Hogan comes out with NWO Hollywood member Scotty Steiner and something I just want to point out here, it's been reported time and time again that fans didn't want to see Hogan vs Nash here tonight, but look at the audience, they're dancing. Fans are actually dancing in the arena before the scheduled match. You notice things like this quite a lot when you you take the time to go back and do your research instead of reading reports or reading books or even watching WWE produced documentaries. Kevin Nash comes out to a great ovation but the audience goes nuts when Scott Hall follows. Scott Hall walks out wearing the NWO Wolfpack colours. Hogan and Nash are now in the squared circle and the two men circle around the ring for a little to waste some TV time. Nash mocks Hogan by ripping off his shirt in classic Hulkamania style. The audience is at a fever pitch and let's cut to the chase. Yes. finger poke of doom. It was all an elaborate scheme. Hulk Hogan just won the World Heavyweight Championship and it was a big plan all along to reunite the NWO while bringing the belt back to Hollywood Hogan. Goldberg shows up after finally making it to the arena. Keep in mind that Tony Schiavone said earlier in the broadcast that the police station was just across the road by the way and Bill Goldberg storms the ring to take out the NWO. Things were going well until Hogan hit Goldberg with the title belt but Goldberg Goldberg was able to spear the Hulkster. Lex Luger then showed up and we thought Luger was going to help Goldberg but instead the total package assists Hogan. Goldberg takes a beating in the ring, the plan Nash vs Goldberg match has obviously been axed and the show goes off the air with Kevin Nash saying to the camera, can you say deja vu. The NWO had reformed and this would be the birth of the NWO elite. Ok, that's the first part out of the way, you now know what happened on TV. Now it's time to look at some behind the scenes aspects and look at how the finger poke of doom truly affected WCW. Let's first tackle one of the biggest questions. Why did Kevin Nash beat Goldberg and who made the decision to end Goldberg's streak? The common story we hear is that Kevin Nash had taken over his head booker in WCW before Starcade and he booked himself to end the streak and win the title. From what I've gathered, Kevin Nash was indeed on the booking committee in some capacity and he did have the ability to throw out ideas, but the final decision still came down to Eric Bischoff. Kevin Nash, along with Diamond Dallas Page, had become what was described as idea men. They had sit in creative meetings and give input but they didn't have any kind of final say. It all came down to Eric Bischoff in the end, but Eric admits that his creative team during this time period were a bunch of yes men. Eric said, I don't know whose idea it was and it's impossible for me to tell you. Other than a few creative beats that I know for a fact were mine, 98% of the things you saw on TV were a collaboration from a bunch of different people, so it's really hard to pinpoint who raised their hand and said Kevin Nash should beat Goldberg. 
It might have been Kevin, but it was probably someone else. Kevin was hesitant. He had seen what happened when Ric Flair was the booker and when Flair was booking for himself. It made sense then because he was Flair, but Ric also got a lot of hate for it. It's a bad position to be in. I doubt it was Kevin's idea, but when I heard it, I went with it. How do you keep the streak alive when there's nobody left? So Eric basically says that Nash could have came up with the idea, but he doubts it. Eric also confirms that he okayed the angle, and Eric did indeed have the final say, so that's done. Kevin Sullivan, who was also on the committee at the time, said, Eric and Kevin were doing a lot of the booking. It might have been Eric's call, it might have been Kevin's call, it might have been somebody else's call, but when they gave me the finish, I said, please don't do it this way. Sullivan pretty much washes his hands of the whole thing, yet he still doesn't say whose idea it was. Kevin Nash himself said, People wanted to see Goldberg get beat, but when he got beat, they went, Oh, I'm not sure I wanted to see that. That's only because of the 15 run-ins, the cattle prods. If we went toe-to-toe -to -toe, and if I had beaten Goldberg with the powerbomb, I would have been a god. The whole thing was designed to put together a faction to oppose Goldberg. It was the old school Hulk Hogan philosophy. Build a team of heels that Goldberg could fight for 8 months. That's the way it was laid out. Anybody that knows Kevin Nash knows that I'm a pretty smart guy. If I'm going to beat Bill Goldberg after 172 wins in a row, I'm sure as f not going to turn around the next Monday, do a finger poke of doom and hand the belt to Hulk Hogan. What did that do for Kevin Nash? What did Goldberg's streak do for Kevin Nash? Now, if I'm going to book myself, I'm going to go on a 173 win streak and dodge Goldberg as a heel. And so Kevin Nash also says that the booking decisions around Starcade also didn't come from Big Sexy himself. Nash makes a great point too, when you really think about it, Nash came out of the whole ordeal looking like a chump. Yes, he did end the streak, but to hand his achievement for doing so to Hulk Hogan really didn't do Kevin any favours in terms of perception. The key phrase that Kevin Nash said though was Hulk Hogan philosophy. When we look at Hogan's history with the WCW Championship, the finger poke of doom has Hogan's fingerprints all over it, excuse the pun. Kevin Nash pretty much confirmed this during an internet at Q&A days later when he said, Until Hulk Hogan completely retires from professional wrestling, he's the man. He can make your life in this business very easy if you're on his team. His money and his power can make your life a whole lot easier. You can either jump aboard his express, earn a ton of money and live an easy life, or try to fight him like I did for almost a year and not get used. You're not going to beat him politically, you're just not going to be able to function in a company when he's on top unless you're on his team. It's a business decision and it's the right decision. Honestly, my theory here is that Hogan wanted to win the belt back in the Georgia Dome after dropping it six months prior in the same venue. The creative team, including Kevin Nash, had come up with this idea to appease Hulk Hogan. Remember, creative control. So a bad decision was made to have Kevin Nash win the title and then Nash lays down a week later for Hulk Hogan. You may wonder why Hulk just didn't beat Goldberg at Starcade, and it's a good question, but keep in mind that Hogan was only contracted for a certain amount of matches per year and Starcade was right at the end of 1998. This could also explain why the finger poke of doom didn't happen the night after Starcade. Hogan's last match before the finger poke of doom was the atrocious Halloween Hobbit showdown with the ultimate warrior and that was months prior. Plus Goldberg had already beat Hogan. Kevin Nash vs Goldberg at Starcade was legitimately the first time the two men stepped into the ring in a one on one match. And then there's the NBC WCW special that no one mentions. WCW were negotiating with NBC to air a special event in a prime time television slot on Valentine's Day along with more specials down the road. After their success with WWE 
WWF Saturday Night's main event, NBC reportedly wanted Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage in the main event for the first special. This explains why Randy Savage returned the week prior and then didn't show up again until April. And this explains why Hogan came out of his quote retirement earlier than scheduled. If NBC wanted Hogan and Savage, then it's very possible that Hogan and indeed WCW wanted the Hulkster to main event the show with the WCW belt. The specials though never took place. The first special was to fill a hole in NBC's broadcast schedule when the NBA All-Star game was cancelled due to the 98-99 season lockout. But in the end, Harvey Schiller told Eric Bischoff that Turner higher-ups were not very keen on NBC making profits from a Turner Broadcasting franchise. And when the NBA eventually returned to NBC after the lockout, the deal completely fell apart and WCW did not appear on the network. If all of this was the reason for Hogan getting the belt, then you have to appreciate the irony and the finger poke of doom happening on TV when, in the end, it was absolutely unnecessary. Hogan possibly won the belt in preparation for an event that didn't even happen. As bad as the finger poke of doom was, WCW airing on NBC could have led to a significant boost in viewership. Still, this all doesn't change the fact that the finger poke of doom was a poor booking decision. It's just a shame that we can't pinpoint who definitively came up with the Nash vs Goldberg finish and we can't pinpoint who came up with the finger poke of doom angle. No matter what stories I've read online or the books that I've read, if neither Bischoff, Sullivan or Nash can confirm whose idea it was, then to me we will never know who came up with one of the most infamous moments in WCW history. There's been a lot said about how fans switched over to Raw when Tony Schiavone announced on Nitro that Mick Foley was going to win the WWF title. Around 600,000 fans, not a million, 600,000, turned over to Raw from Nitro to see the title change. There's no doubt that this was a catastrophic blunder, but as mentioned in Guy Evans' Nitro book, the only book that contains painstaking research into the subject, along with sources within TBS, a total of 2.3 million viewers joined the TBS and broadcast during the Goldberg run-in at the end of the show. This was due to Nitro running a few minutes later than Raw of course, this was an Eric Bischoff tactic that done well to capture extra numbers before and after Raw went on the air. No doubt about it though, announcing that there would be a new WWF champion crowned on the opposing show was a really bad move. It was a free advertisement and a free invite for fans to switch over and see something special. No matter how many viewers WCW got at the end of the Nitro broadcast it was still a big mistake to announce what would happen on Raw. And remember too that fans who actually decided to stay with Nitro were treated to the Nash vs Hogan match. If there was ever a case of getting caught with your trousers down then this was it. There's a giant misconception though that this whole episode of Nitro drove fans away and there was no recovery afterwards. Like this was the only reason WCW went down the toilet. But this is a very, very big generalization that's been put forward to make the downfall of WCW seem more glamorous. To try and blame the decline on a single entering moment on Nitro and it's absurd to do so. Consider this, the January 4th 1999 episode of Nitro was behind Raw with a 5.0 to the WWF's 5.7, but the ratings in the weeks that followed actually showed that there was still some interest in an NWO reformation. WCW Thunder was able to achieve record ratings immediately following the incident, drawing in ratings around the 2.5 area for the first time ever in January and February, and Nitro maintained the same viewership it had done immediately before and after the finger poke of doom, even recording another two 5.0 ratings in the month of January. Sure, the WWF were now beginning to destroy Nitro, but it wasn't until late April that the steady and consistent WCW decline truly began. By that time, Hogan had already dropped the title. So the evidence clearly shows that the finger poke of doom was not the sole reason for WCW's decline. It's clear that it was a mixture of the WWF becoming a better product, WCW and Eric Bischoff being forced to change Nitro's content due 
under pressure from Turner executives, rendering the company unable to compete with the WWF's edgier product. And also, it was due to WCW going to the well once too often. The NWO storyline had run its course by early 99 and people wanted to see something new and exciting, content that the WWF was offering at the time. WWF Raw was simply a better show than WCW Nitro. WCW fans were tired of getting burned too, with weak finishes and scheduled matches not even happening. A fine example being the Night of the Finger Poke of Doom. A lot of fans paid to see Nash vs Goldberg as advertised, and they didn't get that in the end. With that being said though, the same amount of fans would continue to tune into Nitro for weeks after the Finger Poke of Doom. It had no immediate effect, contrary to what everyone seems to publish on websites. So, was the finger poke of doom a bad mistake? It sure is notorious for being so, and yes, we can all sit and say how we would have done things differently with perfect 2020 hindsight. You're dealing with wrestling politics here, you're dealing with Hulk Hogan politics, brother, and as Nash explains, life seemed a lot more comfortable if you played along, screw the fans, and screw the history of the world title. While we have learned that the impact of the incident has been exaggerated over the years, it's still a rotten move. Fans pay money to see wrestling matches and while getting heat is perfectly fine, there's that wrong type of heat and the finger poke of doom had bucket loads of the wrong type of heat. It's the same old same old, it's Hulk Hogan with the world title. It's a bunch of bad guys who pose such a threat that no babyface really had the chance of getting over. It was WCW at its worst during the Eric Bischoff years. Bischoff accepts full responsibility for the whole ordeal, he doesn't push the blame on Hogan or Nash. To his credit, Eric Bischoff holds up his hands and he admits it was a mistake. I'll leave you with this quote then from Eric Bischoff. Were there mistakes? Yeah, it didn't work, but guess what? There's 52 weeks of television every year, hundreds of hours a year, some things work, some things don't. Nobody is 100% of the time. Were there creative mistakes? Sure, I'll take responsibility for that. If I could have done it differently knowing then what I know now, would I have done it differently? Of course I would. But was Starcade and the Finger Poke of Doom turning points? Absolutely not. That's just asinine. That's people who know nothing about the business trying to sound like they do by pointing out things they know nothing about and trying to make themselves sound really, really smart. It's similar to me sitting back on the Monday after the Super Bowl and talking about how I would have coached the game and the plays I would have called differently so we could have won the game. It's no different. There were several turning points, it was not one, and they clearly weren't creative turning points. That's just wrestling dirt sheet nonsense. The real turning point was in mid-1998 when I was told, you're no longer going to use the formula that got you to the dance. You're no longer going to use the formula that almost put Vince McMahon out of business. I knew we were going to lose a bunch of our audience, and we did. I protested it as loud as I could. But that was the turning point. Following the finger poke of doom incident in WCW, the New World Order faction went through another change. The NWO Wolfpack and the NWO Black and White had been at war with each other but when Hulk Hogan joined forces with Kevin Nash after the finger poke of doom, the NWO went through a kind of reboot that was supposed to bring the faction back to its glory days. What we got instead was a messy and sometimes confusing reiteration of the groundbreaking group, this time known as is the NWO Elite, or more specifically, the NWO Wolfpack Elite. Today's video will look at the group's entire run, which was thankfully quite short-lived, and we'll also take a look at how the NWO era in WCW came to an end. As a heads up, my previous Finger Poke of Doom video would serve as a good introduction to this video. It kind of sets the stage for what was to come. The NWO Elite is a hot mess for sure, but hopefully by the end of this upload, you'll understand understand why this version of the New World Order spelled the end of an era for WCW. 
Our story begins then on WCW Thunder, January 7th, 1999, the episode after the infamous finger poke of doom. Tony Schiavone, Bobby Heenan and Mike Tanay kick the show off by calling Hogan and Nash's actions on Nitro appalling and the World Heavyweight Championship had been disgraced. WCW kayfabe president Ric Flair came to the ring and he sent a message to Kevin Nash. Flair said in 10 years time, Nash will have to look at his kid and he'll have to tell the story of how he lay down in the middle of the ring for Hulk Hogan. Flair says that he knows who Hulk Hogan is. Flair was destined to walk behind Hogan since the day the Hulkster walked into WCW and the Nature Boy takes a jab at the Hulkster by naming guys like Dory Funk Jr, Jack Briscoe, Dusty Rhodes, Ronnie Garvin, Terry Funk and Harley Race as true champions of wrestling. Hogan and Nash are going to pay the price. We just had to wait and see how the Nature Boy was going to go about it. Members of the NWO Black and White were waiting for the arrival of Hulk Hogan backstage. Keep in mind that Scott Steiner had been the leader of NWO Hollywood during Hogan's absence, and Steiner had also sided with Kevin Nash after the finger poke of doom, so no one knew what was going on here with the New World Order. Were they still at war with each other? Were Hogan and Steiner now Wolfpack members? Hogan showed up wearing, well, wearing this, and he was also wearing the Wolfpack colours. Scott Steiner, Scott Hall, Buff Bagwell, Lex Luger and Kevin Nash were also wearing red and black. The Giant approached Hogan asking what was going on. Hogan said he would address the state of the NWO in the ring and he asked the black and white to watch his back backstage. NWO Hollywood agreed. Later in the show, the LWO Psychosis had a match with Billy Kidman and after the Latino World Order showed up, the Wolfpack made an appearance. Psychosis and Juventud Guerrera got the LWO shirts ripped off their backs as Kevin Nash grabbed the microphone. Big Sexy said he couldn't believe that Ric Flair would speak badly about the classic Hogan vs Nash match that took place on Nitro. Hogan says that the has-been world champions of WCW couldn't face facts. The NWO Wolfpack had set a new standard and the Wolfpack now runs the show. Just then, the NWO Black and White showed up and the Giant wanted answers. The Giant said that the Wolfpack left the Black and White backstage while this beatdown of the LWO took place and the Giant feels like the Black and White are playing second fiddle to Hogan and the Wolfpack. Hogan said that he's cool with the Black and White but he's not cool with the Giant calling him out in the middle of the ring. The Hulkster says that the NWO are trimming the fat and there's only room for one Giant in the faction, claiming that Kevin Nash is the true big man of the New World Order. And so a match was booked for Nitro the following week. If the Giant can beat Kevin Nash, Nash, then the Giant can take Nash's spot in the NWO. So yeah, it's a mess here, but at the same time, this all sounds very familiar. There's guys wearing red and black, guys wearing black and white, Hogan is claiming there's no divide in the NWO, yet the Wolfpack is still used as a faction name. There's supposed to be unity, but the Giant is facing Kevin Nash on Nitro. There's more questions than answers. On the following episode of Nitro, Hulk Hogan and the Wolfpack showed up in a limousine along with the Hells Angels, and once again, the NWO Black and White were left out. Hogan tries to tell Scott Norton that the whole group was supposed to arrive together and there was some sort of timing issue, but the guys don't buy it. What you're seeing here, this whole thing with the NWO Black and White getting treated like lesser members of the faction, this would pretty much remain intact throughout this NWO Elite run. Guys Wearing the white and black shirts would become known as the NWO B team. Basically, they were the mid to lower card players of the New World Order, a group of guys who nobody really cared about, including WCW management. Anyway, Hogan gets into the ring and he says he'll take on anyone. Nash says he'll prove he's the real giant in the main event. Really, there's nothing special going on. Kevin Nash won his match later in the evening, and so the giant was kicked out of the New World Order. Earlier in the evening, Conan was kicked out of the Wolfpack 2 when he tried to defend Rey Mysterio from Lex Luger. And you may be wondering where Sting was during all of this. Remember, Sting was a member of the Wolfpack, but unfortunately, Sting was out with an injury and he missed out on all of this. 
On the January 25th episode of Nitro, the show opened up with NWO Black and White members Kurt Hennig and Stevie Ray discussing the NWO Elite. Kurt says that Nash and Hogan are trying to push the Black and White away, and Stevie agrees. Stevie and Kurt talk to the other members of the B team, and Stevie Ray announces that he's going to talk to Hulk Hogan about the problems within the New World Order. When the NWO Elite arrived in their private jet, Stevie Ray ran to Hulk Hogan and he said that Kurt Hennig had refused refused to put on his NWO colours. The NWO Elite and the NWO B team then gave Kurt Hennig a beating and Kurt was kicked out of the NWO. Stevie Ray thought this would have been enough to secure him a little bit of status within the NWO Elite, but instead he was thrown right back into the black and white team having to catch a ride with Vincent instead of riding in a limousine with Hulk Hogan. At least there was a little sense being shown here, removing members of the New World Order was absolutely necessary and I'm surprised there was an NWOB team at all. The minor leagues of the New World Order served no purpose whatsoever. While simultaneously working out all these issues among themselves, the NWO's main rivals inside the ring were the Four Horsemen and Bill Goldberg. Kevin Nash stated in interviews that the NWO Elite's main purpose in WCW was to have a faction that Goldberg could destroy over an extended period of time. But like most things in WCW during this time period, long-term booking plans quickly went down the toilet. The NWOB team continued to feel like second-class citizens in comparison to the elite, while the elite began seeing the black and white NWO as more of a hindrance than anything else. You may be thinking to yourself that this was all leading to something, but let me just ruin it for you, it didn't. The February 8th episode of Nitro saw Hulk Hogan approaching separate NWO black and white members and telling each one that they were the leader of the B team, and two weeks later every member of the black and white claimed to be the leader while they argued among themselves. This went on for weeks before finally Stevie Ray became the leader. Stevie Ray won a bottle royal that featured other NWOB team members, making him one of the more unremarkable leaders of the New World Order. Let's go back then and refocus on the Elite, because really, you don't need to know anything else about the NWO Black and White. Hogan's first title defence after the finger poke of doom was against Roddy Piper on the February 15th episode of Nitro. Piper won via DQ when Scott Hall interfered. Later in the week at Super Brawl 9, the nature boy Ric Flair squared off with the Hulkster once again on WCW television, and the world title was on the line. The match ended when a masked man came to the ring and Desert Ric Flair, Hulk Hogan got the pinfall win, and the masked man was revealed to be none other than David Flair, Rick's son. Absolutely nobody cared about this revelation. The audience didn't boo, they didn't cheer, they just didn't care. David also looked incredibly out of place as a member of the NWO, and I know it's not like you needed to be a high caliber superstar to join the New World Order as evidenced by some of the guys who were already in the group, but David Flair made some of the NWO OB team members look like absolute superstars, and what's more, David was wearing the Wolfpack Elite colours. In saying that, Disco Inferno was also a member of the Red and Black, and many people felt that he didn't belong either. Remember what I said earlier about how it was good that the NWO had gotten rid of some members? Well, yeah, they were all replaced. Ric Flair challenged Hulk Hogan to a steel cage match at Uncensored 99 for the world title. At the pay-per-view, Hogan dropped the title and Flair became a 14-time world champion. It was another match filled with Hulk Hogan nonsense, that old he beat me but he didn't really beat me stuff that Hogan played near every time he had to drop the belt. The match was supposed to be a first blood cage match, no pinfalls of course, and even though Hogan tried to pin Flair numerous times, Charles Robinson wouldn't count Flair's shoulders to the mat naturally. But Flair won the match with a fast three count, even though both men were already busted open. And so, just like Starcade 97, it looked like Hogan got ripped off. It was more of the Hulk Hogan bullshit that continued to tarnish the reputation of both the main event scene and the World Heavyweight title, and fans were now getting fed up with it. The same thing happened the next night on Nitro during a tag team match. 
Charles Robinson simply refused to count Flair's shoulders to the mat during a tag team match. Scott Steiner and Buff Bagwell then had a falling out, so we have some infighting going on with the NWO Elite. Where have we seen this before? It looked like we were going to see another feud between Kevin Nash and Hulk Hogan as evidenced on the March 29th, 1999 episode of Nitro. Hulk Hogan was seen talking to Tori Wilson and the Hulkster said that he could beat Kevin Nash again if he wanted to. We wouldn't find out what was really supposed to happen though as Hulk Hogan got injured at the next pay-per-view, an injury that's still debated to this day because, well, it's Hulk Hogan. The man called Sting made his WCW return on the 5th of April. April 99, he was no longer affiliated with the Wolfpack and it was announced that Sting would get a shot at Ric Flair's WCW title along with Diamond Dallas Page and Hulk Hogan. A Four Corners match was set up at Spring Stampede 99, one of WCW's last really good pay-per-views and whoever won the match would be crowned the new heavyweight champion. Diamond Dallas Page got the win but during the match, Page put Hogan in a figure four around the ring post leading to Hogan being being unable to continue the match. In my opinion, Hogan knew he needed to have surgery and this was used to write him off TV for a while. It would also explain why the main event was a fatal four-way match and it also explains why Hogan had nothing but tag team matches since the uncensored cage bout. Also at Spring Stampede, Goldberg got revenge on Kevin Nash by beating him in a singles match and Disco Inferno also had his last match as a member of the NWO. Clearly, things were falling apart part. Scott Hall suffered a food injury that put him on the bench until October. Buff Bagwell and Scott Steiner were fighting among each other and Big Papa Pump would soon end up sidelined with a back injury. Lex Luger had suffered a bicep injury that would keep him out of in-ring competition until September and now Hulk Hogan was taking a break. In terms of big name superstars, all that was really left was Kevin Nash, which is quite ironic seeing as Nash gets labelled as injury prone. With Luger, Hogan, Hall and eventually Scott Steiner all out with injuries, the future of the NWO looked seriously bleak. There was of course the NWO B team, but the Wolfpack had done an incredible job in making the B team look like mid-carters that it would have been ridiculous to raise these guys up into the main event. In storyline, Kevin Nash blamed Diamond Dallas Page, the WCW champion, for putting Hogan out of action. A title match was booked for Slamboree, Big Sexy vs DDP, and Kevin Nash won the match. Being 1999 WCW, the win wasn't without controversy. Macho Man Randy Savage interfered in the match and originally Nash won via disqualification. Eric Bischoff restarted the bout and Nash ultimately picked up the title after delivering the jackknife powerbomb. As the weeks went on, then, the NWO Wolfpack became a memory, the only holdover being the fact that Kevin Nash would still come out to the Wolfpack theme music. The NWO B team would still get featured on TV, but they too began to slowly distance themselves from the NWO name. It seemed like WCW was now free from the New World Order, but still, the television ratings continued to drop. Kevin Nash dropped the WCW title at Bash at the Beach in July in a tag team match. Nash teamed up with Sting to take on Sid Vicious and Randy Savage, and because Savage got the pinfall victory over Nash, the Macho Man became the new WCW champion. The very next night, Hulk Hogan made his return to WCW, and the Hulkster was wearing an NWO shirt. The Hulkster accepted an open challenge from Randy Savage for the world title. Kevin Nash, wearing an outsider shirt, helped Hogan win the WCW champion later in the evening. So yes, Hogan came back from injury and he reclaimed his WCW title on his very first night back in the company. This wasn't an NWO reunion however, after the match Kevin Nash told Hogan that he wants him in the ring and he wants to win the title from Hogan. The Kevin Nash vs Hulk Hogan match wasn't something that WCW had tapped into yet, at least not without finger pokes and all that nonsense. So the next week Kevin Nash aligned himself with Rick Steiner and Sid Vicious, and a match between Hogan and Nash was made official for Road Wild 99, a WCW championship match where the loser would be forced into retirement. 
On the August 9th episode of Nitro, Nash, Sid and Rick Steiner were scheduled to take on Goldberg, Hogan and Sting, and Hogan's American Maid theme played in the arena as the audience wondered what was going on. Out walked Hulk Hogan, once again wearing the red and yellow attire for the first time since 1996. At the Road Wild pay-per-view, Hogan successfully retained the world title, meaning Kevin Nash had to retire. This being wrestling, the retirement didn't last long. Hogan dropped the WCW title to Sting at Fall Brawl 99. The Stinger turned heel at the end of the match by using a baseball bat against good guy Hulk Hogan. Sting also had help from Sid Vicious, Lex Luger and Diamond Dallas Page, so it's as far away from a clean finish as humanly possible. During the same time period, WCW was going through some big changes backstage. Eric Bischoff was getting phased out while Vince Russo was getting brought in, and Russo felt that Hulk Hogan should take a break from WCW and apparently no time frame was given to Hogan in regards to his return. In Hogan's book, which I know isn't a great source, Hogan said he had reservations about taking time off but he eventually agreed to do so. In a fine example of Vince Russo's booking style, Hogan showed up at Halloween Havoc 99 to face Sting for the world title, only Hogan lay down in the middle of the ring, allowing the Stinger to pin Hulk and successfully retain the title. There's been many different reasons given as to why this happened. A common theory is that Russo wanted Hogan to lose in under a minute, but Hogan refused, preferring to lay down in the ring instead. Another theory is that this was done to repackage Hulk in the future for a feud with the powers that be in WCW. Who knows? People seem to dismiss Hogan's creative control clause here, and I'm not sure why. It's to my understanding that Hogan could legally say he didn't want to do the match if he didn't want to do the match, but it really doesn't matter. The end result was another slap in the face to WCW fans who paid for a ticket to see Hogan vs Sting. That's going to do it for today because the next phase of the NWO has already been covered. NWO 2000 is on the channel and I'll leave a link at the end of the video for you to check out. Truly though, the NWO's glory days in the company were completely gone by the time the NWO Elite was formed. Initially, fans stuck around to see how it would all pan out, but by April of 99, less and less viewers began tuning into Nitro as the NWO infighting became more and more confusing. WCW, to their credit, did try a few new things, such as putting the title on Diamond Dallas Page, but in typical WCW fashion, they reverted right back and things became familiar familiar again, for example another Hogan vs Savage rivalry. Vince Russo tried to revive the New World Order with the NWO 2000, but the true era of the New World Order dominating WCW Nitro was now completely over. The NWO 2000 was never going to recapture the feeling of a hostile takeover, and the NWO 2000 was never going to bring back those viewers who switched over to Raw. Things would get even more strange for Hulk Hogan and WCW after Halloween Havoc, and next time we'll look at Hogan's exit from World Championship Wrestling along with the infamous Bash at the Beach 2000 incident. Thank you for watching.